It's the Bennington Show. I'm Ron Bennington. There's Gail Bennington. Yo. And um, I'm Ron Bennington. Hmm. The we're, we're broadcasting out of Midtown in uh, New York City, and the entire city is in cars leaving, except for us. It kind of feels like a little bit like a doomsday movie, and you're yeah. just like, why are we staying behind? Uh, it's our job to be the first pe- person to see the giant wave that's coming in off the coast. Um, well, happy 4th of July. It is a, always a happy weekend. And um, just remember that uh, amity means friendship. <laughs> this is considered by the beaches and all to be the kickoff weekend. But I remember as a kid mistakenly believing that this was midway through the summer and it was time to panic and start going at it hard. Yeah, it does feel a little like we're already at this point when you're a kid. Yeah. Particularly for me, because I grew up very strange because we got out of school so early. In Florida, you get out like early June, or late May. Yeah. And then you're back in August. It's just sick. It's no yeah. way to be. No, it's way, no way to live your life. Um, But yeah, it does feel like this milestone when you're a kid where you're like, now for the July's over. What's left? What the fuck? What is left? Um, uh, today at two o'clock, uh, we're going into the Laugh-In 50th anniversary special with George Slatter. That's airing today, two p.m. on Bennington. Uh, it's going to replay Comedy Greats uh, Channel ninety four this Friday at eight o'clock, Saturday at three p.m., Sunday at twelve and eight p.m. And we're giving away Laugh-In box sets commemorating the 50th anniversary of the series. The set includes 140 episodes from all six seasons of the show on DVD for the first time. Timelife.com slash laughing for all details. People like Don Rickles, Bob Newhart, Debbie Reynolds, Johnny Carson, Cher, the list goes on and on. Everybody who could do that show did do that show. I remember Dean Martin showing up. and uh, Slaughter actually gets into it a little bit because what they did was, if they they just grab people out of the hall, you know, they're one of the major <laughs> studios, and they say, "Hey, come in, we'll shoot something," and it'll take you eight seconds. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. So they would have all these stars on the show without paying them, you know, their regular <laughs> freight, without booking them, without going through their agents, and you know, uh, it was um, it was a very uh, a funny show. All right, we're going to give out. Uh, one of these box sets, uh, 844 Rock God, 844 Rock God, and uh, call in right now, and we'll give out the box set, 140 episodes, all six seasons of the show on DVD, and coming up at 2 o'clock, George Slatter. Uh, it's an interview. Me and him actually watch clips of Laughing, and it was just a... Uh, Odd and joyful day for me. You know what I mean? This was like the day after we did the unmask, so we were like good buddies already. Yeah. <laughs> and then just to sit around on those couches, and he told me a bunch of stuff off the air. He told me one thing he asked us to pull. <laughs> uh, and you did pull it, Chris? Yes, it is nowhere. It's yeah. about a... Um, well, uh, he brought up two people in Hollywood, two famous people. Um the man in particular, everybody listening, and went out and said that they were married, and he said they'd still be married if she could take a punch. <laughs> and um, it's fucking it's such a hilarious, great line. But uh, that's real uh, fun, old school stuff, and uh, I-, I think you're going to enjoy it. Chris, the phones blew up, all 12 lines. Give me a number between 1 and 12. Five. Uh, Troy in South Carolina is the big winner. Yeah, Troy. Yeah. You did it, Troy. You got in. To everybody else, uh, we got one more of these, and we're going to do this again in about an hour. Uh, and then at 2 o'clock, George uh, Slatter, who anybody uh, in this room, in this building, or anybody listening would have switched lives with him in a heartbeat because he's just had the funnest <laughs> craziest great life of all time yeah he has so many incredible stories and he's so charming i mean honestly i think this whole staff just like 
fell in love with him when he came in. Sure. Because, uh, especially like, you know, the younger people on our staff who are not as familiar with laughing, like watching them die laughing at his stories. And it was just so much fun. Well, if you are in somebody who wants to be in front of or behind the stage for anything, if you want to produce, if you want to write, if you want to perform, those are the stories that that's a college education in show business right there because right. he says the first thing of producing is lying and when i just did the and he would say he would go to the uh network they would give him notes and he would say fantastic these are great i'm gonna and then not do them <laughs> in the last on mass with ari shafir he says he's being told all these things and he's like, great, I'll go back to the comics with that. And he doesn't. <laughs> right. <laughs> because the creative people know what the other creative people need. Yes. You know what I mean? And um, and then you know th- enough to know the people on the business end need to be told yes. Yes, they have to be told yes. And it's not even important whether it gets done. You just don't need to challenge them in that moment. So you're like, yeah, oh my God, is that a good idea? You can't tell the business people the truth. And the truth is... Your job is to keep the lights on, hit payroll, pay the taxes, you know, pay the water. That's the truth. Right. At the end of it, they want to believe I do this and I'm a creative person. But they never are. Because if you were a creative person, you're like, oh, fuck, I forgot payroll. Right. Shit. (laughs) I got to fucking get somebody. You know. (laughs) Right. But. The And that's why, you know, because money is the only important thing, it's always the money people who move up into that position, and then suddenly they believe, I want to get involved with something. I, I, I know who's funny. You shouldn't use that guy. You should use this guy. And I'm like, mm, where did this come from? Where did you think you picked up on this? From knowing how a spreadsheet works. But the truth is, the creative people always end up working for the money people. And it's not just true of this. Go to any tech place. Go to any fucking... It's always a salesperson who moves up in the world. Yeah. Because selling is, you know, that's where the money comes in. Exactly. No one gives a shit. (laughs) If you just watch Shark Tank... um, there's no those people don't know anything other than how to make the deal. Yes, they're all deal makers. They don't have any creative ideas about no. anything, but they'll be like, you know, why this won't work because of something I know to be true in the trend of sales. Right, like that's that's their insight. Yes, it's like, oh, this tends to do this kind of percentage, or this is too big of a market. But they don't go, you know, what's really wrong with this is that, you know, and then they don't have a spark of something. To suggest. I, if you consider yourself like an amateur inventor, I'm going to give you a problem that needs to be solved. And it's, it's a, well, it's a small thing that you wouldn't think was important. Uh, I'll give you this. In these phones, whoever came up with this little rubber thing that goes around your phone, you never see cracked glass anymore. Mm. When you first got iPhones, everybody had a crack. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. And this... Fucking weird, dumb, little, seems like a simple... Just little bumpers on the side. Yeah. And it's it, it has solved a major problem. There's another phone problem that needs to be solved. I walk around New York City all the time. Women have three quarters of the phone to eight tenths of the phone sticking up high above their pocket. Yes. Their asses keep the phone from being as... Com- you never see a man... Yes. Whose phone is exposed. And I'm, uh, I don't know how women live like this. It's We have no choice because the design issue is in the, the jeans. That the, they so, give us tiny pockets because right. of the roundness of our butts. And there's no way to have a round phone pocket. Like, well, I think, yeah, that's what we need is we need somehow a lengthy pocket for women on jeans. Because that the it's that way with anything. You can't put a a large wallet in a woman's back pocket. It sucks. But women never do attempt to put anything in their back pocket except for their phone. And it, I look at them and they're all they're all going to lose their phones. Genesee leaning in. <laughs> no, I I do it all the time. You lose it like too. That time that I was walking by and you thought I was uh, scratching my butt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for my phone. <laughs> 
<laughs> I am waiting. You ain't got to lie, Jen. You ain't got to lie. I am waiting for Jen to apologize to me today. I already went to HR and filed a formal complaint because she punched me on stage. <laughs> she did. And where was Vito and Chris? When I'm attacked, you guys got to come out of it like the fucking big brothers that you are. <laughs> she gave you a full punch on yeah. stage. Well, first of all, she punches literally like my sister, where it's a back punch and all the power comes from the elbow and, and the elbow and wrist right it's and a it's, whip yes like you, it's a woman's punch is just they've whipped their hand at you it's almost like getting punched by i'm gonna say it feels like you got hit by a dream or a fantasy or a thought like if 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 jen boxed against my sister it would go 150 rounds and no one would be hurt <laughs> And literally when she was doing that, I was like, damn it, that's the way my sister gets me. Um, great, great time last night. I'm not going to give any, way, any of the surprises. I'm sure some people have uh, heard, thanks to anti-social media, I'm now calling it. Uh, especially after what Trump said about Mika. Uh, that was all over the news today. It was yeah. just the stupidest shit I've ever seen. The stupidest shit I've ever seen. MSNBC treated that as if it was just a ratings play, like you're all listening this morning. Joe and Mika were supposed to go on vacation, but they'll be here at 7. And I'm like, I'm stupid because I'm watching it. Yeah. I'm waiting for 7 like an idiot. But how bizarre that we have a president who this is the conversation we're having because he tweets things like that. It's just a, it's weird all around. It's well, weird to talk about it, but it's like you can't ignore the fact that this is so strange that a president is doing this. But and then the White House, their defense was, you know how he is. He's going to tweet back. If you say something about him, he's going to hit you 10 times harder. And then a woman on the news goes, mm, you know who does that? My six year old. <laughs> My six year old. just. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking kill ya! I, I kill ya! That's over an arcade game, actually. Mm. <laughs> um, well, that's true. Uh, but it, it was an unbelievably fun night at the stand. Uh, the audience was amazing. The comics were amazing. Um, there was a uh, also like a surprise comic who came in and, and jumped. That up. was great. It was just a fun. Fun night all the way around. I don't know when we're running it because we've already put together all of our best ofs for next week uh, where we are hosting it. And it's, um, I haven't listened to all the stuff. Vito picked out a lot of them, but he's very proud of it. Yes, these are curated by Vito, his special picks. Yeah, so most of it are about Vito. Or, <laughs> Vito related jokes. Uh, there's a lot of stuff about The Rock. Springsteen <laughs> shows up and Spider Man. <laughs> What what is your what is your big comic book? Who's the one that you love out of all the comic book movies? Uh, I'm 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 a Spider Man. Like I grew up with those movies, so I'm excited for the new one coming out. But, this it, summer. but who's I'm asking? Who's your number one? Oh, guy? it's it's definitely Spider Man in general. Like I read the comics growing up. I know a lot about him. Like I what's to know? He's a fucking kid. He's a Spider Man. He's bit by a spider. He fucking takes his middle finger, and somehow a web comes out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and this is the third reboot in the last 15 years i don't get just, involved with that oh no i'm done i mean the last one was a failed trilogy that they stopped after two movies and yet when you tried to say it was shitty everybody yelled at you you know what i mean i know because i was like this guy's shitty and i was like you're fucking and i'm like okay and now they do it every time i remember when the fucking la that other star wars trilogy came out people were screaming that it was great and then a couple years later they're like that was shit and i go you were mad at me when i told you that these right. are shit. These are fucking money grabs. I'd rather just open up my fucking door at night, let Hollywood come in and take some money and leave. <laughs> Save I, time. I am going to see Baby Driver. Yes. Um, I'm very excited about that one. And I think, I, I can't remember the last time that there was a summer movie I was excited about seeing. Um, did you guys record Big Brothers last night? I recorded it, uh, but I have not yet watched it, so I will be catching up tonight. Did the Big Brothers uh, yes, do a we, podcast? We did not do a podcast, but we did, we'll do a podcast, but we caught up. We watched it last When time. is the next podcast still? Uh, we got to figure out Monday or Tuesday. Oh, no, we uh, can't. That's July. <laughs> You got want to just end it? Like no, 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 no. We can come in. We can come in. We can come in. This July 3rd. show is so 
stupid. <laughs> there was a kid last night um, <laughs> having some kind of obvious claustrophobic panic attack. Two days in. I'm like, don't they have fucking the psych thing that you got to pass before you're doing this? Yeah. Oh my God. He's, th- you're watching a poor, unhinged person. Just mm-hmm. coming apart. Just from claustrophobia? He doesn't know it's from claustrophobia. He thinks it's the paranoia of the game. Now, which one is Josh? He is the Cuban, Cuban. guy. Oh, no. He, he had a He's bad not, He doesn't have the kind of energy where you want that guy to snap and be crazy. No, he is already there, too. Um, he's like, you know, people have to backstab you here. They're at the- yes, that's the fucking game you signed up for. Well, it's like if you were in a football game and you're a halfback and you're screaming, everyone's trying to tackle me. <laughs> I'm just trying to run with the ball and they try to throw me down on my back. Uh, you've got a big Gale Meets Girls that's already been released. Yes, I, uh, we did a, uh, early release at the iBang. So, uh, this is Tammy Pescatelli and Yamanika Saunders. So you can go ahead and download it, uh, for your, for your weekend drive. Uh, I'm going to tell you something right now. I've listened to the last, well, I've listened to every one of them. I'm fucking cracking up at this one. I'm going to put you on the spot here. I haven't talked about off the air. Okay. I think you got to do a, an event one night. Really? You gotta, yeah. Get like an, a, an all star team together. And because it's so fucking crazy funny. Yeah. I, I mean, Yamanika and Tammy together, which I should say that they don't know, they didn't really know each other. That's hard to believe, too. Um, uh, they met each other one, like briefly, the, like the night before we recorded it at Skankfest. So they like, just shook hands and that was it. So they had never sat down and talked and they were hilarious together and they're so different and so funny and they have very different opinions on things and it's it's a really funny episode. There's uh, a crazy amount of funny people out there now. There's a crazy amount of funny people and I was thinking that when we did the, the street jokes last night because only one of the comics was prepared mm-hmm. at all. <laughs> um some of them were trying to blame Chris, but come on, prepare yourself. Yes. But this happens. I go to a lot of specialty shows, and it's amazing how many times yeah. people aren't prepared. And this is like some of the naked roasts. They'll just come in and they'll go, oh, this is naked? Shit. Okay. And then they take their clothes off. And what, I mean, like, they're not even wearing cute underwear. Boldness. <laughs> there's a fierceness. And there's no reason that show should have been as funny as it was. And yeah. it was fucking hilarious and i mean from a structural point of view (laughs) i mean we're kind of half in that half-assing it and then most of them quarter-assed it and it was just (laughs) fucking it was a blast so funny because it's just fun to hang out with funny people and be silly and that's really (laughs) what it comes down to we gail and i are being so loose with this event we actually walked on stage with the house lights still on yes this is Never happened in the history <laughs> of comedy. The audience wasn't warned that a show was beginning recording. The house lights are on. Yes. And I'm like, well, this is um, this is what this show is. It just is very loose. I was like, hmm, it'll be nice to see everyone's faces, I guess. Uh, an associate producer punched the host on stage. Yes, which that did happen. I believe is a felony. I watch Bosch, <laughs> and I believe that's a felony. <laughs> Bump 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 ooh do 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 boop 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 do 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 uh this got uh, written in does Vito think they are a bank or a post office that they can't do a podcast on a holiday? Vito <laughs> is not Vito isn't what you would call a thinker, but he gets in the world of Big Brother and he's Rain Man. <laughs> He's <laughs> he knows so much. Too much for for me, and I've seen every fucking season except for the computer season. Yeah, and I can't follow him. Yeah, because he's like Steph. This is the same thing Stephanie did. How and does an he, And you just how like, does he know everyone's dude, name so fast? Like the, after he, the first episode, he was saying names to me, and I was like, I don't know them yet. This is I don't what know them. this is what I want to teach him from a broadcasting point of view. Right? You don't want to be the physics teacher that is so smart. That none of your students can follow you when you get an F. When I listened to the first episode, 16 names, 17 names were being thrown around constantly. There was no, here's the guys, here's the girls, here's the people we think we can. It was just a potpourri 
just pulling into a bag, throwing out a name and a background. And I'm like, I watch the show. <laughs> and I'm sure he knows what he's talking about. But you've got to let other people know that what you're talking about. Yeah, I got to work on just being more descriptive and of the people you, and you slowing slow down. You got to slow it down. And then you ought to have like a little segments. If you're watching... If you're watching a sports show, they don't start to talk about every NFL team at the same time. They go to the East, they go to the West, they go to the wild card, you know? You just can't be suddenly, you can't be in a conversation about the the Raiders, and then that reminds you of something from the Bengals in 82, and thinking that the audience can follow you along. You are, you're Mike and the Mad Dog of Big Brother, there's no fucking doubt about it. But you gotta slow that shit down and explain it. Yeah, I gotta. I'm gonna make some. I'm gonna uh, send some notes over that ideas that I have to you guys and see what you think. No, oh, I don't care. Notes okay. on I'm our just notes you. on our notes. No, 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 no. notes on myself on what well, I could like taking. Bl- bl- believe me, I don't care that you stink. I am just saying. <laughs> <you're> better. <laughs> I want to have the best Big Brother podcast out there. Now, the the thing that I also want you to know, right? And like, if we were playing the porn, like studio head and fucking host, right? And I'd be the studio head. The host doesn't send notes to me, to the studio. <laughs> Here's some notes and some things I want to change about myself. I gave you notes on myself. <laughs> if, just read the notes yourself and change. Uh, Montreal Comedy 101. We've already got a couple heavy hitter judges that we decided yes. not to even announce yet. I, I, this is something I do poorly. You should just always announce who are you guest star and then people be, but I like to excite people when they get there, but I can't do that anymore. I know it's tempting though, because the thing is the first couple of times, that's how we did it. And it was so exciting to see people react yeah. when they didn't know who was going to be coming out. Freaking out. Last night, the biggest pop of the night was the excitement of who stopped in. And you know, if, if he was a regular comic on the show, they would have been like, "Hey, Yay, I'm glad but he's here." They, people like somebody just walked in that they didn't it's expect. A pop in. <laughs> yes, people <laughs> love a pop ki- pop in. And when I was a little kid and I was watching Johnny Carson, if Bob Hope would come walking out, right now here's the thing: <laughs> Bob Hope would just there would be two guests talking, like Johnny would be talking to the guest. And then all of a sudden you would just hear, thanks for the memories being played, and Bob Hope would come out, <laughs> and the people would go crazy, and he would, whatever they were doing, that person would move over, Bob Hope would, I just stopped by, you know, doing a big special, Johnny, and you're doing a great job here. I wasn't even a Bob Hope fan at all, <laughs> and I'd be like, this is unbelievable. I fucking caught on on the night with a big pop <laughs> in by Bob Hope. Um... Comedy, Comedy 101 is happening Friday, July 28th at 11 p.m. at the Mainline Theater in Montreal as part of the Just for Laughs Comedy Festival. Go to the iBang.com to find out how to get tickets. I'm going to just say this to the city of Montreal. A, I love you. B, you got to be as fun and as cool as Austin was. The Austin fans were unbelievable. I feel like they're all our best friends for life. Montreal. I'm looking for you. I know. Like, it's going to be, that's a tough act to follow. Yeah. The um, the people that we met in Austin and just, like, how much fun we had at the festival itself, it, like, it was so unexpected. So now the bar's been set even higher. Um, to let you know how much fun Austin is, next Friday, during our best of, we're just going to play the Skanks show um, that I guessed it on and Chris Stanley became an infamous guest of. Yeah, uh, by attacking the city of Austin, <laughs> uh, they deserved it. And we've never done this before. And I don't think this is played on serious because the skanks are on on serious bonfires. Yeah, on serious. But you'll hear how funny uh, the skanks are in this show. Also, one of the people from the bonfire was so high I don't believe he talked much, <laughs> at least while I was there. <laughs> and I know we had to go over and I think open for. Ali Wong after that or do something. He had to leave early. Yeah. Yeah. He um He was gone by the time I got on stage. Is that right? Yeah. So I, I saw him after guy. after Ali Wong and he did seem a little frazzled. And like I didn't realize that was the answer. <laughs> I saw him later that night and he was all yeah. blacked out. <laughs> so I, I think this is gonna be very enjoyable. So that's next Friday. Uh Big J Louis Gay Jay Gomez, Dave Smith, the infamous Skanks, and um, 
they put together a very odd kind of a debate show. And Chris, who did you debate? Uh, Josh Johnson. And uh, what was the debate about food? It was about food, the North versus the South. Who, who had better food? And I debated Sal Vancano, who we had just uh, done it, an unbelievable unmasked with. That was so much fun. And uh, I believe it was either the same day or the next day, something Yeah, like I think that. it was that night. And then, yeah, we Im immediately went into debate mode. And our thing is, who has the better racists, the North or the South? <laughs> better as in nicer or better as in more racist? And by the way, they booked me and Chris half hour before the show <laughs> said you're going to be in the debate and then change what the debate was going to be about as I was walking to the stage. Yep. And yeah. and uh, the person I was supposed to debate changed three times. Who who were all the people? Do you remember? I, I know that one of them was supposed to be Shane Torres, which was a West Coast <laughs> comic. And then eventually, like, they didn't even tell me who I was debating when, bef like, before, like, the show was going on. I wasn't sure who I was debating. And it wasn't, like, you didn't necessarily ha agree with your point of view as like being an attorney. You know what I mean? Like you can go from being a prosecutor to a d d defense attorney. Um, I will also uh, say this for the uh, about Montreal. Uh, if you're if you live in uh, Vermont and New Hampshire, that's a short fucking hop too. And yeah, we'd love to see you up there. We'd love to see some expats, some afternoon expats. <laughs> yes, and it's a great festival to you know the it's whole thing is really really cool experience. Is, I mean, the amount of shows is uh, overwhelming. How many great shows are going on one after another? Too much. It, yeah. Uh, Justin, are you here today, or both interns are here today? Send Justin in real quick. I want to talk to him about it. Um. Because he's worked for that festival, and uh, here's a uh, and you were educated in Montreal. Yeah, so great town. Everybody yeah. loves it. But I've never been in a place where people feel the need in the summer to be outside every night, wearing as little clothing as they can. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I definitely don't complain about it. But yeah, it's the brutal winters. Like it's just so windy in Montreal. Like. I, the way the cities are set up, it just creates wind tunnels sometimes. Here's the beauty of it, though. The number of ass cheeks yeah. that you see. Good God. The Daisy like, Duke is alive and well in Montreal. Like, <laughs> yes. Full butt, ch like, you know, like full cheek showing. Yeah, bottom cheek. Yeah, bottom yes, cheek bottom, showing yeah, underneath cheek. cut off shorts. It's, really it's nice. crazy. It's nice. Yeah, it's all over the place. It's like a very French look. Yeah, I guess maybe it is. Yeah, there's a lot of borrowed uh, European uh, trends and stuff for sure. Well, you know, that little French-Canadian accent is so That's fucking so sexy. Yeah. I watch uh, French-Canadian TV. I don't watch anything in English because it just looks like bizarre and fun. And then, from what I understand, people from Paris come over and say to them, what the fuck are you even saying? Oh, yeah. You know what they I mean? tell them to shut up. Like, <laughs> I, I, I'm not kidding. I have multiple French friends. They're just like they. They're just like talk to us in English. Yes. <laughs> well, here's the thing. It's like it's like New Yorkers going to Arkansas or people from Alabama going to yeah. fucking Boston. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're just like. How is this the same? Thing? <laughs> and is it also probably the slang is pretty different? Yeah, so even for sure, for sure. Like the swearing is different. Like they love to say like putain, and we're like all oh, tabarnak, you know, yeah. call this that type of shit. Well, you know, uh, but yeah. but d d does Montreal feel Calis? <laughs> <laughs> Vito's last name is Fuck. Is that the, yeah, the yeah. On it? And I, was, I swear to God, if we just go around showing people his like license, uh, yeah. he. People will freak the fuck out. Now, well, there, there was a party, right? Yeah. Where the guys, the door guys, were like, "He, it's real. This is really his name. They've been waiting for him. Yeah, we, it, was, uh, it was one of the after parties, and uh, we walk up, and they're like, hold on one sec. Just you. Just hold on one second. And we're like, Ugh. we're looking like, shit, he's not going to get in. Like, we thought we took care of this. And then all the guys come over, and they're laughing. They're like, he's real. I can't believe it really. We're like, what are you guys laughing at? Huh? His name is Fuck. His right. name is Fuck. <laughs> All right, I have a spy report here, and it's spoiler alerted, and it's about uh, Big Brother. So if you guys want to put your fingers in your ears, that's up to you. No. Here's my buddy, Lewis in Manhattan. Lewis. Spy report. Hey, what's up?
what's up, guys? Yeah. Yeah, the spy report is that Megan freaking selfie victor herself. I don't know when, but she's not in the game right now. Who's what? Megan? Uh, the multicolored hair. The girl. one who got yelled at by Josh last night. Yeah, Wait, the interrogator? The guy. interrogator? I mean, girl, whatever. Yeah, she yeah. left. Here, this is like she goes. She was all fucked up and did. She probably wants to get out and have a lawsuit or something, you know. <laughs> but the thing is, she's like, I don't even. This is too much. And I'm an interrogator, and I'm looking at my TV, and I'm going, Oh, it's fucking different when you don't have all the power, though. Right. You know what I mean? When they yeah. yell back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, okay, I didn't see it, but I I'll still watch it. Just tell me what was the thing that set her off. Oh, well, that fucking know. idiot. Just, that fucking moron. The, the Cuban guy. The Cuban guy oh, snapped right. on her. Yeah. 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 Which I guess we're not supposed to know that he's gay. But Because <laughs> who misses their mom that much? Yeah. <laughs> Fido. What, what, what's that about? It is they yeah, didn't, they didn't even replace her with the nerd guy. They should have replaced her with the nerd guy. I think they put someone else on the block instead of her. I think they put Alex on the block, which sucks again. Well, yeah. you know, I mean, the thing is... I mean, I don't know if somebody deserves to come back in just because somebody else. No, but I, when I was looking at the Cuban guy last night, I said he's going to DOR. I thought for <laughs> sure you told me he was out the fucking door. Because I could see him leaving Big Brother, going to a cheap motel, swallowing an engagement <laughs> ring, and then hanging himself in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> that got dark last night. <laughs> he, I, I mean, seriously, that's a guy who should never smoke a joint. He is fucking <laughs> fragile. I'm not stupid. I'm not. I'm an intelligent man. No, you're not, dude. <laughs> you're not fucking intelligent. Owner. I'm saying A to you first, Vito, and then B to the character. Uh, all right, thanks, Lewis. Thanks for all right. spoiling. All right, bye. Look at this. This is the couple I called the summer couple last night because they were all summered up. Johnny Gogo, -Go. Johnny. What's happening, buddy? Hey. I got to first say, it was such a great night, and the energy in the building was so awesome. If anyone has a chance to go to Montreal, just go do it, because these Bennington events are so much fun. And the, this, the family atmosphere and everyone's just laughing. It was just such a great night. But, um, you say family always, atmosphere, you, and I heard one comedian say the word cunt 18 times. <laughs> 18 times in one joke. <laughs> you know, my favorite part of the night, I was walking out, and I said to Vito, good job, and I patted him on the back. Yeah. And it was literally like he had just gone out of a swimming pool. With <laughs> yes. And I said, the guy wasn't doing, I, I don't know what he was doing. <laughs> he under a heat lamp. Well, you know, we, make, uh, we made another mistake because we're like, hey, it would be fun to have our whole staff tell a joke when they go on stage. But then when it's time to get together, everyone's walking around telling a joke to the, in their own head. Yes. And I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> I forgot people were worried on how they do on stage. That was... I went to go turn around to ask people, and I looked over, and every one of our people on our staff was in a corner whispering the lines of their joke over and over. And I was like, oh, my God, you guys. You're going to be on stage for 30 seconds. It was... Everyone did a great job, and it was so much fun. The one other thing about the audience and your fans is it, 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 it's really unique... You guys put up three pictures of Chris Stanley this week. Yeah. You, there was no show prep for it. There was no, it just like accidentally fell into your lap. And for 72 hours, I just read Twitter and <laughs> laughed my ass They're off. They're very, very like, funny. They're, They're the very, very who funny to people. The the show are just really quick and sharp and just on top of it. And you, I just, I just don't know if there's another show out there that's like this. It's just so damn funny. I was in the airport yesterday reading the Twitter and I couldn't listen to the show, but I just started laughing my head off talking about <laughs> Blink Twice and, and the Syrian refugee camp and the dead eyes of a porn star. And I, I just, these people are so goddamn funny. I, 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 I will guarantee you today's picture, no one will laugh at or even meme. Yeah. It is that sad. Yeah. It is. I don't know if it's sad. No. Yes, it is <laughs> sad. <laughs> Actually, sad. Yet? No, uh, I think we forgot all about it. Tell you the truth. All right. Um, but I don't think it will get anything uh, but horror from people. Yes. I was it was saved for a reason. <laughs> and I realize that my head is somewhere else right now. But your childhood is just like Bosch's. <laughs> <laughs> you are Bosch. He's so Bosch. Yes. Chris so Boshley, Bosch. I call him. <laughs> 
I uh, went home last night, by the way, and waved a towel. Oh, that was that was uh, amazing. And by the way, I'm sorry that you got replaced as our PR person. Listen, and, you know, Samantha's nice, and she does a good job. She's getting a big head. She's got a reserved table. She uh, is. I, just, I don't like any part of this. Here's the thing. She's adorable. You're <laughs> fun. She's adorable. <laughs> You know what so, I mean? Like, uh, so adorable beats fun. Oh, all the time because you can <sighs> see, like, that's somebody that you want your brother to marry. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, you, on the other hand, you seem like um, you seem like one day the FBI is going to kick the doors in. <sighs> I, I told her this morning, I said, I can't believe that you've replaced me. But and you know, this is the same thing Hard Rock flip. Johnny said about you, Johnny. I know. Yeah. She just she smiles, giggles, does a hair flip, and she's like, oh, sucks to be you. And I was like, see, that's the attitude of a hardened PR person. <laughs> All right, Johnny, great to All see you. Have a great fourth, guys. Love All you. Right, see yeah. you soon. Bum, 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 doo, 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 bum, bum. All right, the Chris Stanley... And we keep going backwards with these pictures. Yes, we're and, going back in time, each time earlier and earlier in Chris Stanley's life. Um, but the this picture is infant Chris Stanley wearing a giant pamper. <laughs> um, I thought it was too, too large. <laughs> yeah, it was. That's for six-year-olds. Uh, but it, <laughs> it depends. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. Those are adult depends. Now, Chris, by the way, it looks like, and you're a thin kid, but the belly's growing <laughs> yeah. at a pretty good rate. I'm a baby. <laughs> I think that the pamper was that big because you shit <laughs> giant man logs that they couldn't have you in oh, one. Oh, I'm sure they were still liquid at that point. Um, now, there are also people b believing that there's no way that this is post-1970. Nothing about your... Fucking life looks like it's the decade you swear to us. You're ten you years missing. <laughs> so it's a it's a cute baby, and I guess you're on the floor. They've put something down on the floor. Is that the bed? It could be a bed. I have why no is idea. there a chair there? Then yeah. Oh wow. I didn't There's like a metal chair. I think you might be on the floor. <laughs> That's great. Mom. On the uh, Smokes. just like a just yeah. like a sheet on the linoleum floor. I think. And the sad thing is, there's a. A baba, as they would say it, yes. a baby's <laughs> bottle, and uh, a pack of smokes right next to that. Yes. Which your little, and you can tell that you're going to have shoulder problems, your little arm. Yeah. <laughs> it's how I sleep still. Uh, was just raising up to get head. the smokes. It, you are you know, actually. Your... Yeah, I do. It's strange. <laughs> but Those you... kind of things are weird, right? I know. It's like the digging for me. It's like you have the same, you have the same tendencies. The things that comforted you as a baby and a toddler can be something that comforts you as an adult. It's really I, I, strange. I don't, I don't know why things like that happen. But as we said, this one isn't funny at all. It's uh, no, this one really, really made me sad. Why is it sad? Because you look neglected and you look like you're about to. Grab a cigarette. There was obviously someone there. They took the picture. All right. Let me just. It's so sad looking. Let me read some of these tweets as they come in. One just says, my God. <laughs> um, and then, ha ha, the baby bottle and the pack of cigs. One week later, he switched to Marlboro Reds. <laughs> yeah, I like lights. Uh, the original pit stain. That's where it all started. Oh my God, that is the pit, too. <laughs> right one. He is always <laughs> lifting the right One pit. is just a shock face emoji. Uh, then milk drunk. Uh, cigarettes and formula, a Jim Jarmusch prequel. <laughs> that, my friend, is very funny, Streep. Uh, five, Mar my five Marlboro miles towards a crib. Uh, the Queen and another slice and another piece of the puzzle falls gently into place. That's fucking hilarious. Who needs a pack a pacifier when you got a pack of cigs? Good point. Even as a baby, Chris was shocked how much he sweats. <laughs> Start the kid off slow and give him Marlboro lights. Here's Uzi Poo says this. Raise your hand if you're going to be 30 with no parents. Jesus oh, Christ! Oh my Dang. God! That's horrible! What the fuck? That is so horrible! <laughs> Shit! Oh <my> Asshole! <laughs> How did I not get that one? Oh my 
<laughs> we can't believe that somebody make a joke and then yeah. you're like, why didn't I think of that? I could not. I don't think I've ever would have thought of that joke. <laughs> it's terrible. It's I don't have any, oh yeah. Th- Thank you for not thinking of it. <laughs> Little floor baby Stanley, what? smoke up. Was Chris born on a buffet table? Looks like a chafing dish up there. <laughs> exactly what a newborn requires: a bottle of milk and a pack of Reds. Smoking with Chris, episode one. That's from Tim. Oh my god! Oh my god! This is. You should see the other guy. (laughs) Jonathan says, "Oh no, Christopher fell off the TV tray." That cat said, who knew it was possible to be born with a beer gut? Okay, it has a baby. <laughs> the weight jokes are really getting to me. Looks, <laughs> looks like it a, should get to you. Looks like a future NASCAR. T- I can't even get them up. These are flying so fast. <laughs> Let me just uh, slow it down a little bit. Future NASCAR fan bottle, Marlboros, and a diaper fit for an adult so his parents could change him just once a week. Me. All right. Liz sets fire, and this is not her usual uh, wit, but the bluntness, I think, works perfectly. Mm -hmm. It just says, fucked from jump. (laughs) 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 Foreshadowing for the forehead. (laughs) hundred bucks, that's a white Russian in the milk bottle. (laughs) Uh, Was this before or after the fire department gave him back? Mean. Paint me like your other French babies. <laughs> oh my god, I love a solid Titanic reference. Uh, and the gut is still so big. That's from Drew. <laughs> and just as hair, hairless. Uh, looks like he slept in a dresser drawer. <laughs> Did not add Here's a Paul. He's not napping, he's passed out. <laughs> <laughs> Picture from the Surgeon General's case against smoking. Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, you, be using Canada. <laughs> you just know that that bottle will always be half full. <laughs> he still wears the same size pampers. <laughs> I, uh, I wear underwear like an adult male. I am not a continent. <laughs> like we say to Trump, you don't have to fucking slam back every time there's a shot against you. It's better if you just let it ride sometimes. I can't let it ride. Especially the baby gut comments. That's what I really bothers me. He'll be he'll be fine there for a couple hours. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is this is John. <clears throat> My intestines are this big. <laughs> uh, another John says, "Is that a hand-me-down diaper?" Hope not. I swollen shut from a little pop in the face, maybe. <laughs> I would bit a bunch of baby in the face. I'm a little gimp-eyed, yeah. At least I think that's just the timing of the picture. Gimp-eyed. I'm fucking gimp-eyed. Is that a term? Oh, yeah. Has he ever worn anything in his life that doesn't smell like cigarette smoke? That's an interesting one. Yeah. I don't think so. Um, Pepper Hicks in the baby diaper, doo-doo pampas. It's odd. So- what the fuck? I said Marlboro Reds. Getting the lung cancer going early. I mean. All right, this is great. This is Darren. Right. Hold on for it. He's a Zippo and a pair of wings away from being on the 1984 album cover. <laughs> Van Halen fans only, ladies and gentlemen. The Sherrod says, he got to know things. <laughs> got the jokes. People over here doing well. <laughs> Um, <laughs> TC Flag. No wonder he liked the Teenage Minch- Mutant Ninja Turtles. Only one thing missing is his shell. <laughs> <laughs> That's fucking not nice. Where's the SIDS when you need it? Stop, oh, stop with the SIDS jokes. World's biggest soft spot. <laughs> <laughs> From an early age, he knew one side of his body would sweat more. It is odd. That that is his sweating pit. That is yeah. his pit. And he's, he's getting, always he's airing off. that shit out. <laughs> he airs it out. You got it. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Do you have a size ten hat for my newborn? <laughs> I mean, size eight. Look at that round belly. 
But this says, oh, hell yes. <laughs> um, all parents want their children to be better off than them. Chris is graduating to Marlboro Reds to fulfill that wish. Uh, SIDS before SIDS was cool. Rocking tit milk and nicotine since 1974. 83. There's no fucking way that's 83. <laughs> I'm not There's lying no about way. my age. <laughs> Maybe you just weren't told, Christopher. <laughs> Maybe they didn't put you in school till you were 12. <laughs> See, I don't find this picture funny at all. No. This, this is the sad one. I don't find it to be sad. And we got to meet Chris's special lady last night. Yes, we did get to meet the special lady friend. She's a knockout. She's nice. And she is... And How did you explain her, Gail? I think she's... I think she's beautiful, she's sweet, and she's like a person you want to have a conversation with. She's a real person. Yes, yes, she's a real human person. That you would be like, if you met her, you'd be like, I would like to be friends with this person. Right. You know what I think? We meet too many chick comics. You know what I mean? <laughs> They're all so fucking bananas. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, a week old and already testing the whiskey one eye focus. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like his diaper, diaper fetish started early. I don't have one of those. <laughs> seems like you do. Because I, I, I was a baby wearing a diaper. It seems pretty uh, normal. Proof that the Nazi salute is innate. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Not a white this, all, this one says same size arms as now. Wait, don't come on, man. You got a decent you, spread there? Yeah. You got a windscreen? Oh, yeah. Mm, Sick. T Rex arms. Everyone knows it. <laughs> Starring shot for a Law and Order SVU episode. It's fucked up. Oh, God. These characters are so damn funny. They're kind of mean, Ron. Well, look, you got a very fucking special lady right now. I do. You guys going away this weekend? Did you decide? Not sure. I haven't decided yet. <laughs> take, take the lady out. I think. Do something nice. It's a very, uh, it's a very fun thing. The first trip of a relationship. You think that's too early, though? How how many weeks in are we? Well, uh, two over just over two months. Wow. Oh, so you didn't even let us know yeah. until five was, weeks in. Yeah, five weeks in. Yeah, he was flying. <laughs> and that's only because I it brought came it up. up. Yes. Yeah, I, I, you <laughs> Would it still be a secret? Possibly. Yes. Now, do you keep it a secret from us? To save yourself or to save us? No, I, I, this specifically was. I was really into her, and I didn't want to tell anyone, and I didn't want to jinx it. You wanted to keep it precious. like I. But So I was like, all right, we're together. Now I can talk about it. Well, smart. Keep it precious. I think that that's a, a fine amount of time for first trip. It might be a little early, but a well, little weekend trip. You know? Maybe this would help out a third wheel. Vito, you want to get away <laughs> this weekend? Maybe you guys can do an on-the-road Big Brothers. <laughs> Yeah, it'll be fun. Uh, there's a lobster boat I know we can all go on. <laughs> She's going oh, nowhere near that fucking lobster boat. That would be nice. Look at that lonely fuck, Vito. <laughs> it's lonely over here. Hey there, lonely girl. That's Vito's song. Mm -hmm. My only girl. There's got to be some fucking She's special out. needs girl out there that would like She's Vito. Out there. I could do better than special needs. What's wrong with that? Dude, where's that? Just saying, I can do better. Dude, why, where would that judgmental. fucking come from? That's, man? Really... that's not what I meant. What? <laughs> yeah, why yeah, why you said that. Oh, you know why? That's why you're alone, Vito, because mm -hmm. you fucking think you're better than people. You're fucking ableist. That's what he is, Ron. <laughs> What's that mean? Like, he, he's he's racist against people who have That's not racism. Needs. Why don't you just be an ableist? <laughs> yeah, that's why he says he's explained what it would mean. Yeah, I'm but you don't fucking listen to your partner over there. No. Can I tell you something? You want to be anything, be a straight racist, okay? It's tried and true. <laughs> Don't be a disabledist. <laughs> Racism works. We've had it since day one. It keeps us all in line. Yeah. Um, Hard Rock Johnny wants to jump into this. He was the guy before Johnny Go Go. Mm -hmm. you remember? I remember. Um, Johnny. Johnny? I thought that was a picture from Chris's last Tinder date. <laughs> oh! You oh, piece yeah. of garbage. <laughs> <laughs> he touches kids. No, I don't. I date adults. He touches adults. <laughs> <laughs> you sure? Yes, positive. Johnny, you're already down the shore? I am, of course. It's Friday. It's... Fourth of July weekend. You dropped that chicken neck in the water already? <laughs> uh, chicken back. Yeah, you oh, you go with backs? backs? 
Wow. Okay. I do. We always well, did next. Talk about racist. Mm. <laughs> I don't really just put a full turkey down there. And I'd bring up like 18 fucking crabs. <laughs> and here's the beauty of it. Still would cook that turkey later. You know, kind of, Crab turkey. In the brine. In the nice brine. The brine. Exactly. Yeah. Nice salt brine. Uh, I'm also curious, why is, why is there a little, is that like one of the stands, that little metal thing, that looks like one of the stands when you go to an old-time restaurant and they put the pizza on the table? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So is there like a pizza there? What is that? I'm not sure what that is. No idea. I think it's a chair. I think you're on the floor. And, and, and that's the bile, that's I think a couch cushion that's like taken yes. off the couch. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, sometimes you put the baby down on the floor, you put do a you, nice... Do you fucking... think he was held enough? No, he wasn't held at all. I doubt that it. Makes first you of really all, sad. he's been thrown down on that old spank black blanket that your dad. Spank <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! He's lying in a big oh, jizz fucking god. stain that's only fucking four hours old. <laughs> <laughs> so Johnny, uh, how long are you staying down the the beach till Wednesday? <laughs> Probably come up Monday. Oh. We'll do, really we'll for the fourth. Take care of. And then do, uh, yeah, we have people over to our place on the 4th because I can see from, from our place, you can see New York City and probably about 10 other fireworks shows from my balcony. So I would stay there. The 4th of July party. You know what? Johnny uh, is one of those guys that, I don't know what it's called, but it looks like a onesie. He wears that thing when he's down at the beach. <laughs> what are those things called? Young? Jumpsuit? I, mm. Jumper? Hooba? I don't romper. know. Like, romper. Romper. Yeah. Romp him, I think they call it. From a male the romper. Yeah. Romp him. All right, Johnny, I got a break here and give out some prizes, but have a great 4th of July. We love you, buddy. You too, guys. Have a good vacation. All right. He's the best, right, Johnny? Yeah. Love Johnny the best. Yeah. Love Johnny so much. Uh, let's give away uh, the prizes again. Uh, this is the last time we're doing this. This is Laughing 50th Anniversary Special with George Slater. That's uh, uh, airing in just an hour here on Bennington. It's going to replay on Comedy Greats Channel 94 this Friday at 8 p.m., Saturday at 3 p.m., Sunday at 12 and 8 p.m. And we are now giving away the Laugh in Box set commemorating the 50th anniversary of the series. The set includes 140 episodes from all six seasons of the show on DVD, timelife.com slash laugh. And we'll take a break right now uh, and give away these uh, this, these box sets. But we got a guest coming up, Chris. We have Doug Benson stopping by. Nice. Doug Benson. <laughs> Doug Benson, everybody. So we'll be right back. Uh, I'll tell you what to do before we do it because the phones blew up. Chris, you do that thing where you give me a number between one and... Twelve. Nine. 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 Uh, right back with Doug Benson. This is Bennington. Doug Benson's yeah. here, everybody. Hey, everybody. Ow. Hello. Now, uh, you just did Doug Loves Movies. What was it Monday night? Yes, sir. Monday night, Gramercy at the Gramercy, which we've been lucky enough to be part of, and it's a fun, fun show. But this, you got an amazing guest. You got Edgar Wright right before his movie's coming out. Yeah, wow, that's, that's insane. So huge. I was very excited to uh, make that happen. Uh, he and I have been uh, pretty friendly since uh, when the movie Scott Pilgrim vs. the World came out. It opened the same weekend as an Expendables movie, mm-hmm. and it just sort of, uh, it, you know, in August, I think. And it just didn't really uh, get the attention that I thought it deserved. It's genius. It's such a fun film. So I, uh, ahead of its time, I think, and so I talked it up a lot on uh, my Twitter and Doug Loves Movies, and uh, Edgar's really uh, hands-on with people who love his work. Uh-huh. And so he reached out to me and said, thanks for uh, you know being so nice about uh, my movie. And then uh, now every time he has a new movie, he comes on Doug Loves Movies. That's so great, man. And I also get to go like uh, hang out with him at screenings and stuff. Now, have you ever been on any of his sets? Have I you haven't. Because I don't understand how he directs. He's never shot anything in Los Angeles yeah. uh, since I've known him, uh, because he uh, Baby Driver's all in Atlanta. Yeah. And it's Atlanta for Atlanta. Like, it takes place in Atlanta. Yeah. Because uh, he was personally sick of seeing movies that... Uh, 
you know, are shot in Atlanta and it's supposed to be some, it's supposed yeah, to be right. New that York or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That happens quite a bit. Because Atlanta is, a, uh, every time I want to get, you know, John Hamm, who's an old friend of mine, every time I try to get him for the podcast, he's shooting something in Atlanta. Yeah. Like he, yeah. everything he's in is shot in Atlanta, apparently. Uh, but yeah, so, uh, Edgar was on last Monday night and, uh, Baby Drivers is, is amazing. It's such a good movie. Now, I, I've loved everything, literally loved everything Edgar's ever done. But mm -hmm. a friend of mine said, this one is not really quite a comedy. Is that true? Uh, I think it's pretty funny, yeah. but it's, you know... It's, it's not aimed at being a comedy. It's basically a heist movie. Yeah. And Edgar, you know, loves car chases and heist movies. Uh, you know, like one of the inspirations for this one was uh, Walter Hill's The Driver. Oh yeah, yeah. With Ryan O'Neill, it's got this has got the same sort of feel to it, where where like it's not like Fast and the Furious, where like, like cars are shooting into the air. Yeah. You know, it's just cars on the ground, right? <laughs> driving very fast. Yes. The, the old school seventies <laughs> gearhead movies that was just like a, a genre at one time, where it would be a guy he's either a car thief or you know he's running whiskey or something, and you would watch. Well, Tarantino did something similar when he did his movie, where it was like really a physical car doing physical things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, no CGI involved. But Edgar, I don't know how he uses the camera. Like, I can never figure out how the camera moves the way it does. Yeah, he's uh, very impressive with that uh, that stuff. Yeah, like it's uh, you know, he's my favorite director. Oh, he's amazing. He's a he is a guy that. And, and it's a very short list anymore, but I try to see every film that he does in the theater. Like, I go to see his, but I don't need to read about it, and you don't need to know, just, I'm going to go and, and just keep following his career. Yeah, when I watched the trailer, like, uh, a while ago, I was like, okay, I don't need to see anymore, I don't right. need to read anymore. Like, I, <laughs> I already saw too much, I was I was already hooked five seconds in. So I've just like I've been trying to just flush the memory of that trailer out of my mind so everything could be really fresh. Well, Shaun of the Dead was such a shock to me because yeah. I'm not a zombie guy, right? And that movie was fucking ridiculously brilliant. Just brilliant. It's so smart. It's so funny. You yeah. could watch it like 50 times and like find other things that you love about it. Yeah, his stuff is really easy to watch over and over again. And like you could see already, uh, you know, his influence, some of the things he does uh, just popping up in, in other films. Yeah. You know, because it's so, uh, it's so distinctive. And that like he finds. Like, he's been sitting on Baby Driver for, like, 20 years. He's just had this idea. What if a getaway driver just listened to music and uh, that's the soundtrack of the movie is you hear, right. hear what the driver's listening to? And uh, and he finally made it happen. It's, it's so actually, brilliant because yeah. it's kind of like... Like, I'm waiting for him to make, make a full-blown musical because mm -hmm. I think he's a person that could pull oh, it absolutely. off. Absolutely. <laughs> he could make a true... <laughs> yeah. Like, when they would try to make rock musicals, but they, they didn't feel... Like rock and roll, this would feel like rock and roll. But it has a name where, like, it's not just soundtrack, but if the people are listening to it themselves, right? Yes, that, like there is a name of the type of song that shows up in a movie that's actually in the reality of, of the, the film, movie, yeah. as opposed to what we yeah, are Yeah, what listening. is the word for that, Chris? Yes, you should be, yeah, you should be looking <laughs> it up right now. It does exist. But it is, it is a word. It's that kind sounds of, uh, right. Yeah, it's kind of a rare thing. Uh, the first, I don't know if it was the first guy to do it, but American Graffiti, because they were listening to one radio station. Yeah. All the young, there was like one radio station for, for the young people. They were all listening while they were driving their cars. And I remember the first time I saw it, is that's a fucking, such a smart thing to do. Everybody's connected yeah. by that music playing. Diegetic sound. That's Thank it. you, Chris oh. Stanley. That's it. Go into the pretty good prize closet, pick oh. something out for yourself and your special lady. I will. I will give myself Great a job. Round of applause. Great job. I think there's a. It's group a lady's on. choice. There's Say it again. In there. <laughs> Dia Diegetic sound. Diegetic yeah. sounds yeah. too much like dyna dyna Dianetics. Dianetics. Yeah. Dianetics. That's what I'm into, right? <laughs> I I got to see. Well, you know the person who. That actually works on me is Tom Cruise. He's the guy. Really? That, yeah, You're he helps me do the e-meter, and uh, he's very supportive. That's shocking. Very, very fucking very he must be high up. Yep. In the he works hard. Uh, he does work hard, and he is. They say the number two guy at that thing right now at Scientology. Right. Only. I, I I hope I'm there the day that he becomes Scientology Pope. 
That would be yeah, my best. Yeah, when he's crowned. Don't see the mummy. I'll tell you that because it's just a two-hour recruitment video for Scientology. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's just Tom Cruise standing there swinging a watch bob and saying <laughs> saying you will be you will be get clear. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be like, "Okay, Tom, what else are we doing after that? Another divorce? Where are we going with this?" <laughs> I really would love to make like a movie, maybe um a, a Valley of the Doll remake and only use Tom Cruise's ex-wives because they're all really Great. They're all really exciting. And uh, to get those three together, yeah. phew, that would be the best show ever. Or even just another First Wives. What though. are we talking about? <laughs> Which ones was he married to? Mimi Rogers. Mimi yeah. Rogers was number one. Nicole, Nicole Kidman. N mm -hmm. Number two. And then uh, the little girl Katie that... Holmes. Yeah, Katie Holmes. I was, you know, I was setting up to do like an exciting <laughs> reveal, but okay, Katie Holmes. Um, and now, here's the thing about Tom. He either takes the kids completely or never sees the kids that he leaves behind. I find that fucking fascinating, too. Yeah. that's To me, that's the perfect divorce. <laughs> You'll see, Daddy, maybe when you're 18. I don't know, though. <laughs> but I'm not going to come around, you know, once a week to take you to play fucking bumper cars. It's not going to happen that way. Who's your favorite out of all of them, Chris? All the ex-wives club. Nicole Kidman. Nicole Kidman. Kidman, yeah. easily. She's pretty classic. Yeah. Yeah, I'm obsessed with Nicole Kidman. I'm a Mimi Rogers guy. I'm a big oh. Mimi Rogers fan. Old school. How about for you, Doug? She, I played poker with her. Really? Mm -hmm. sure. In one of those, you know, kind of celebrity pro-am kind of poker tournament things. That must be difficult to concentrate because I'd be like, oh, I forgot I was looking at your tits. I don't yeah, know yeah. what is going on. Right I'm, now. Like, I'm like, Mimi, could you put those away? <laughs> yes. I'm looking at a winner here. <laughs> I, can't, I can't focus. Well, you can put them over at my house if you need to. I'll watch them while she's playing. Do you need to put them in storage or something? But yeah, that's, you know, the, 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 the hot ladies who play poker, they know what they're doing. Yes. They, they know that it makes it harder to concentrate. Plus, you, you know, you don't want to take their money. Yeah. You know? You Who else plays feel poker? Like laying like it down. Who are the other women, the starlets that play uh, poker? Jennifer Tilly, super into it. Yeah. Oh, Love yeah. Jennifer Tilly too. I wish I... she married Tom Cruise. That would be perfect for the next project. <laughs> Should have gone clear. <laughs> <laughs> um, another? There's you know hot lady pro pokers. Yeah. But I'm trying to think of any other famous ladies. Think, oh, 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 yeah. oh, oh, the girl from American Pie, Shannon Elizabeth. Oh, that's yeah, a surprise. Really? She's, a, that. she's a big poker player. Yeah. But Jennifer Tilly's all but like left the business to become a professional poker player. Yeah, right? and her boyfriend Phil Locke is yes. a huge. He's the, they, they called him the Unabomber, which I never understood the charm in having that as a <laughs> yeah. nickname. Was well, that because he wore sunglasses and a hood? Was he always had yeah. the hoodie up all the time. Yeah. yeah. That was another, <laughs> another intimidation uh, <laughs> tactic. It's either tits or a hoodie. You, know, yeah, you work, well, you work with what you've got. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so out of all the Edgar Wright films, this Baby Driver moves up to your number one spot. Well, only because it's the most re you know, yeah. it's the new one. Because uh, I, I, I just, I, I'm continually amazed by how much I, you know, I love each movie that he, yeah. that he makes. And, you know, and there was that four-year hiccup here where we didn't have an Edgar Wright movie because he worked so hard and long on uh, pre-production on Ant-Man. And then, you know, that didn't work out. And uh, so, and now these guys getting thrown off of Star Wars, right? Miller and Lord, like it, it just smells a little bit like uh, you know, there's still uh, you know a little bit too much uh, control issues coming from the well, these things, studio. The, yeah, these franchises are being directed from the top. You know what I mean? Like they are not, they don't really care. In my opinion, who the actors are, who the directors are, who yeah. the writers are. And this this whole thing, it's bound to kill itself because you can't create from that direction. But James Gunn gets away with it somehow. James the Gunn. Guardians it, movies are yeah. amazing. Here's what I think happened. I don't think they expected that franchise to work at all. They <laughs> left it to him. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they, they, they didn't know. Yeah, they and then once, it, once yeah. it, the first one killed, and the yeah. second one, they're like, well, we'll just have to trust him. Yeah, and we're do, gonna... that, do those characters come from... Oh, like a comic book, yeah, comic book. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but n n a lesser read comic. Book, yeah, like you a. Know? Yeah. It wasn't one that like everyone knows Batman, right? And then some some of these comic books just the real, mm -hmm. and then those ones they can go oh we can take them and do whatever we want to, as long as they get it first. But Gunn figured out how to make that thing work, 
And now they're like, fuck, I guess but, it's his. Yeah, maybe you're right, because it wasn't too precious yet to like people right. where you had like a million right. rabid fans. Well, and, Spider-Man, everybody thinks they could do it. Yeah. I mean, only, they know it. They know that story. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited about this new Spider-Man because uh, Chris Stanley grew up on Spider-Man. <laughs> that was Vito, Doug. Vito. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Vito. Vito. <laughs> right, that, we that look alike. He's the other brother. <laughs> Son of a bitch. Vito, what is your oh, Vito, what is your Vito. favorite Spider-Man so far? I mean Spider-Man 2 is like the, right. the like pinnacle of like the no, superhero movie. Give me the give me the plot of that one. Oh, uh, that was Doc Ock, uh Toby Maguire. I think that's the last one I saw. The great <laughs> Alfred Molina plays yeah. Doc Ock. I, I like mean, the it's, first it's a pretty one good one. Because the Roosevelt Island Tram was in it yeah. and then Jim Norton was in it. Oh, yeah. Remember Jim Norton <laughs> was mean about Spider. He was a guy on the was, street. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's right. He was right. very young at the time, and he goes something about he stinks. <laughs> it, was very, it was just like when Norton was just getting known, and like to see Norton in a movie at the time, it was like just so funny to me. And he, I, when Jim was on Douglas Movies, the answer to a question I asked him was Spider Man. He didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> That's your favorite thing, right? I like to slip those by the people that are in movies. <laughs> I like to the answer to be the movie they're in because when they don't know it, all the all the uh, people in the audience have a real nice time. <laughs> yeah, that is um, <laughs> that is. I don't want to be vicious about yeah. it, but it's it's just funny how little people know about their own movies. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is Jimmy in Spider Man. He stinks, and I don't like him. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. It's great. And we went fucking crazy. Well, the right channel. then, after he said that, he had to turn and talk to uh, Jerry Orbach and uh, <laughs> one of the other detectives. <laughs> it's totally like a law and order. Yeah. Like, yeah. the guy's doing his job, and he takes a moment to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to complain about Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. He, has, he hasn't, his look hasn't changed that much. No, no. no it, that it, looks it, like Jimmy yeah, today, he, really. I think maybe he put on weight after that and, and then, then lost, lost it, it again. Yeah. yeah, I think. But the <laughs> but the head looks pretty much the it's same. It's a good line, though. It's got the same really, dome. Yeah. Really handsome young man. <laughs> <laughs> um did you want to plug something, Chris? Oh, yeah, because Doug Benson's in studio. Doug Loves Movies is happening this Sunday, July 2nd at the Improv in Kansas City, Missouri. Go to DougLovesMovies.com for tickets and all additional dates. And on Twitter, at Doug Benson. I brought Sweet. a game. A new game? Sure. A game for you guys to play if you'd Great. like. I love to play games with you. No, Vito doesn't get a play, though. No, Good. Vito, you're Good. out. Good. It's, <laughs> it's all about The Rock. That's his favorite. <laughs> his favorite actor is The Rock. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's the best response way, to that. That's okay. all time. <laughs> all time. All right. He's jumped over Spencer Tracy, <laughs> Peter O'Toole, The Rock. That's the guy. Are you excited about the new Jumanji? I saw the trailer. It's weird. I, I didn't. It sure is weird. It was yeah. a twist that I didn't expect with like the people playing. The character. It was weird. Yeah. That the, the, the Rock throughout the entire movie is actually a, a young lady. Is that right? <laughs> right? No, no, no. Uh, Jack Black is a young lady. The Rock's just some like skinny white. Some kid. dude. Oh, a skinny kid yeah. who doesn't wow. know doesn't know how to use rock size strength. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Basically, they get zapped into this game, uh -huh. and they get it's like almost like if Clue, if suddenly we all got zapped into being, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Mustard yeah. and uh, all the different. <laughs> but we wouldn't look like ourselves. We look like Mr. Mustard. <laughs> so Jack Black. <laughs> so a little girl turns into Jack a Jack Black sized yeah. man. <laughs> and uh, and then another is it a, is Kevin Hart a girl? Kevin Hart, Ken, no, I think it's just uh, Jack Black's the only only girl. girl okay, mm -hmm. but then girl, there's a girl, a girl in the group that was a guy. There's a girl that's a girl. There's a girl that's Jack Black. And oh there's my two god! Guys that are guys. It's like he's talking about Big Brother. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <He's Andy. laughs> he likes what he likes. He does. By the way, you gotta respect that. Uh, you know that Chris had a, a line not that different from. Like Norton, just that kind of cameo thing. Uh -huh. It was cut out, right? They yeah, cut it was it cut out. out, yeah. And that was of Ghostbusters. And what was your character? I was like a construction worker. You were a construction worker, and you were wearing the I hat had, like, and everything. The, the vest yeah. thing, yeah, like the, the reflective tape. What was your line? Go, go, Ghostbusters. Well, it should have stayed in there. 
And you had to go to Boston to shoot that? <laughs> yeah. <Wow>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was, go, go, Ghostbusters. Yeah, we Sounds got like it. a New York success. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. So you good. actually sure. played a New Yorker, even though yeah. Yeah. you made up you a are character of what a New Yorker yeah. is yeah. like. An old even though, New yeah. And he has an accent. Yes. Yeah. Who are you saying it to? The actual Ghostbusters? Like they're going by like this fucking kill ghosts or catch them. And I was like, go, go, <laughs> Ghostbusters. <laughs> they're in the car? Yeah, they're in the car, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. But you didn't see them. No, no. You were just That's what I'm saying. Yeah, it's just yeah. from me. It's yeah. just the from, yeah. Yeah. You're just pointing the camera at you. Yeah. Yeah. They're, home, they're yeah. home or at lunch while you're doing your thing. Exactly. And you, you did it twice. They just went, uh-uh. No. They're that like, was, um, really hurt. Right. Let's not even devolve, bother it developing this old 1970s <laughs> film stock that we're using. I mean, there isn't somebody else saying that in the movie, no. is there? Yeah. No. They okay, just that's good. At least they you went didn't get different replaced. Ways. They, just they, told we they went, went the way of not having it <laughs> yeah. at all. Yeah, yeah that, which hurt. <laughs> they made it. It made them hate it so much. <laughs> Sometimes people get cut, still have a credit in the end credits. Did oh. you get a credit? No, I didn't get a credit. Uh, okay. He wouldn't have got a credit even if they would have kept it. He just would have been passerby. This passerby as Schwarzer. himself. <laughs> <laughs> now, did they, because of your show, do you see everything in screening rooms, or do you have to go to the theater? I see things in screening rooms from time to time, get invited to a lot of that kind of stuff, but I mostly just like to really see it uh, you in know, the theater with an audience, or or, or without an audience. You know, yeah. I like seeing it like in an empty theater, like a matinee. Uh, a lot of things, yeah. But certainly in the case of Baby Driver, you just got to see it with a crowd that's just pumped and excited to be oh, there because it's, it's it's so much fun. I can't wait for this. It's one. you know he casts Kevin Spacey as a guy who has to say the word baby a lot, <laughs> <laughs> and he says it so great. You know, what I mean, most actors you'd be like, oh, enough with his saying baby, but like you want him to say it again. <laughs> He's like, drive the car, baby. <laughs> and just like, God damn it, this is so cool. All right, Spacey. <laughs> Back on the big screen, folks. <laughs> yep, yep, he sure is. And 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 Jamie Fox is as mumbly as ever. And uh, <laughs> John Hamm getting to see a different kind of different side of him. Yeah, because he's usually more of a hero than a bad guy. All right, so you know the game already because it's named after you, Ron. It's Great. Ron Bennington's adjusted for inflation bureau game, and. Um, We'll start with Chris, and then we'll go to Gail, and then we'll go to Ron okay. for this, this first round. We got four rounds and a tiebreaker. And uh, Chris, all you got to do is tell me. You just have to guess okay. the title of a movie that this actor is in that would be hopefully number one, but two or three would be worth some points as well. I'll take that. I could use the points. Yeah, you just get as many points as you can. That's the points. idea. Points. Uh, the films of Al Pacino. Ooh. You got to remember the injustice for inflation yeah. Yeah. part, because he's been in movies for for years now. I'm gonna say Godfather One. Did they call that then? Then? Yep. Right out of the gate, they, they called it. Away. They God. called it. Puzo hadn't even written the second book yet, and they were like, "I love the Godfather One." The Godfather. All right. What do you think, Gail? I'm gonna go ahead and go Godfather Two. Interesting. Ooh. Which was called Godfather 2. Yes, that actually <laughs> was called Godfather 2. Now, I'm I'm trying to think if he's ever done any blockbusters more recently, you mm-hmm. know? And I know he did Dick Tracy, but that flopped. He was in the Danny Ocean twelve or thirteen. I'm gonna. I think it was thirteen. He's Ocean 13. thirteen. Yes. Yeah. He plays, I'm gonna take that. He plays. His last name is Bank. Yes. And he has a casino <laughs> called Bank. <laughs> You never one. saw it. No. It's ridiculous, and I never turned it off. They, I've never seen thirteen. They trick him into thinking that there might be an earthquake, and yeah. that, that he needs an earthquake <laughs> testing machine in his in his office. And it turns out that they use that against him. Oh my god! It's just like you know how the first one is like a heist movie, yeah. and then a little hard to believe. This one, they just start nuts. They just start nuts. Uh, okay, so uh, unfortunately for you, Ron, yeah. uh, you were so close. Coming in at number three was Dick Tracy. Oh, yes. shit. Third highest grosser. Well, I think he played, what was his name, that big boy? Yes, he was, was big, like boy. big yeah. boy. Uh, 
But uh, coming in at number two, Godfather Part Two. Mm-hmm. Yay! So Gail gets points. two points, and uh, <laughs> and of course, number one is the Godfather. So good job, Chris. You get thank you, Chris Stanley. No stopping you there. Three points for that. I got it. And adjusted for inflation, that must be a gigantic. Yeah. Th- you know, I mean, that, everyone see it. Everyone saw it, and that movie stayed, I think, in the theaters for like two years. Jesus. Like, yeah. So like people would. Just go back to the Godfather. Over yeah, there. I remember. Like, uh, like that's when I was looking at the adjusted for inflation list. Like, Gone with the Wind's number one, mm-hmm. but like, it's amazing how low some things you think would be. Like, Titanic's like twelve or something. Yes, you know. And uh, but some of the ones that I I just remember as a child, the, the phenomena of like lines around the block for these things yes. were The Exorcist. Jaws, Jaws, yeah, Godfather, and uh, there was one other one where I was like, yeah, I remember. The talk was all about how you had to wait in a long line to see it. Well, the, the, there would always be this thing. You would look in the newspaper, right, to see what was playing, and it would say, held over for its 12th big week. <laughs> yeah. They would always write that like it was a play. Yeah, well, there wasn't as many theaters. There wasn't that many theaters, and a lot of times, these films would play wow. in Boston. Oh, Sound of Music. Yeah, Sound was of Music was like gigantic. Every city had a theater that yeah. played Sound of Music for a year. Yeah. The Sting was also like Sting that. Sting was gigantic. Like, there is a bunch of movies like that where it's just that movie was in that theater. And, it, and like, you know, like when I grew up in San Diego, Star Wars was at one theater uh, for long enough for them to put out ads on the anniversary of one year. Wow. Where it was a cake with uh, the candles were C-3PO and R2-D2 and uh, <laughs> <laughs> a couple other characters. Did you see they saw that, uh, they sold that 3-CPO the other day for oh, yeah. uh, like two and a half million dollars or something? I'm like, there's one thing, I wouldn't mind having that. You know what I mean? Like, I know a lot of things are dumb to buy, (laughs) but if I was rich, (laughs) give it to me. I'll put it in the living room. I would have liked to buy for my apartment the the disco floor from uh, Saturday Night Fever. Yeah, yeah, they sold that not too long ago, too. I'd just be in there dancing, that one (laughs) dance. I would just work it for years until I had a party. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Gail gets to go first this round. Okay. And uh, it's the actress, Diane Keaton. Ooh! Ooh, this is a, in her this is three? very interesting. She's great. Um, I you know initially I feel like it's going to be a Woody Allen movie. Yeah. Um. Gotta be. But oh wait, hold on. No, no, no. It's not. It's not. I know what it is. It's got to be The Godfather. God damn it. I was, <laughs> I was holding on that. Shit. I, I'm going to say Godfather 2. Okay. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah, you see the way I tried to get with nothing? Yeah. <laughs> well, she, Godfather 3. What's that? Godfather 3. I don't know I, if she's even in that, yeah, but it was definitely didn't make a Let ton of money. That, isn't she a, a, a cartoon voice somewhere, though? Like uh, one of the Dorries? Ron knows this game. I'm glad it's named after him because... <laughs> so you give up? Uh, Chris? Yeah. Uh, the, uh, number three was Godfather Part 2. Mm. So that's good for one point for Ron. Thanks. And then number two, I wish I could give you points for it, uh, Finding Dory. Ah. Oh, oh, she has a voice in that. She was and the then number one, three points for Gail, the Godfather. Yay! Yeah, you, know, you really pulled out of that yeah. one. I thought you were really going to commit to a Woody Allen movie. <laughs> Literally, uh, and I was doing that. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 it's a it's team. Yeah, 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 sure. Like I'm helping. To your own daughter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's cruel. Literally the way we play games at home. <laughs> it's so mean. All right, well, speaking of mean, uh, mm. Ron is gets to go first this round, and I feel like I know what's going to happen. Uof. Uh The films of Marlon Brando. Ah, the great Marlon Brando. <laughs> I'm going to say Godfather. Number one answer. Okay. Stress. True guardian desire. Okay. Ooh. It's really hoping for an yeah. inflation yeah. thing, I guess. Um, and yeah. then I guess I have two guesses right now, and I yes. don't know what to do. We'll say that. Should loud. I talk them out? Yeah. I mean, you like wanna. you guys don't have to we like won't. tell me. Yeah, we yeah. won't. But tell I have you. I have some thoughts. Okay. Mm-hmm. So yeah. my initial thing. I'm going to go with... Wait, just say it. All right, no, no, no. I I think I know what it is. I think I know what it is. I'm going to go with Superman. Oh, shit. (laughs) Is that a good idea? Yeah. Okay. It is a good idea, but remember, there are, you know, Superman. Oh, he's in multiple multiple Supermen? Yes. He is? Um, 
Maybe not. Maybe just All right, Superman. I'm going to go with Superman because I don't know the yeah. name of anything yeah. other than the first by the way, Superman. Bro- <laughs> by the way, brilliant, brilliant pull on that. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. As, as good as you're going to get under yeah. the circumstances. Because number three, Apocalypse Now. Yes, I was leaning yeah, towards that too. Yeah, that's what's going to be my talk out. I swallowed a bug. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, number two... Superman. Nice. Yes. Great job. Yeah, so Gail, this is your day today. Yes. Gail. Um, and, and then number one, The Godfather. Yeah. yeah. See what he does? Yes. See I see what he does. He, he has like a little See how he plays trickery. those like puppets? <laughs> he does. Yeah. We're yeah, just so, dancing puppets here. So Chris is in third place with three, and Ron's got four, and Gail's way out in the lead with seven. Yeah! So, uh, Ron, you could tie this up, and Chris, okay. thanks for playing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but you're a, you're a spoiler, you know. Anything can happen because uh, you get to go first. Oh, this is good. Yeah, that means if you tank it, you might be. Who's after it? You, Gail or me? Uh, we've goes, been doing Gail. Then okay, shit. Yeah, yeah. Then don't tank it. <laughs> Robert De Niro. Mm. Robert De Niro. Adjusted for inflation. <laughs> <laughs> still yes. the game? Yes. Oh, hold on. No, so. <laughs> Robert De Niro, so, he's Italian. Yeah, he, no. The actor Robert De Niro. You mean as an actor, right? <laughs> Fuck. Meet the fuckers. Okay. Mm. Okay. Um, I think, again, uh, we're in a similar situation where I have two and I don't know which Talk to it choose. Out. Talk it out. <laughs> Um, Daddy's here to help. Because <laughs> I know what, like both of us are going to take one or the other. Yes. So I'm going to take. I'm going to take Godfather. Ooh, huge mistake! Did I? He's not in that. Oh wait, can I? Take- <laughs> yes, you can. He's in Godfather too. Oh, okay, that's what I mean to say. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm. What did you take? Meet the fuckers. You really are a fucker. We got that off the table I'll, as well as Godfather Two. Uh, I'll just go meet the parents then, because the, these were massive movies. All right, coming in at number three for Mr. De Niro, Shark Tale. Ah, oh, oh shit. fuck! <laughs> Always got to watch out for the goddamn cartoons. Those cartoons mess. I up never every think time. about yeah. the cartoons. The uh, box office mojo where I get this information from. Yeah. Puts cartoons and cameos in a lighter font. Uh, like it doesn't even count. <laughs> yeah. But I think it counts. <laughs> yeah. that, and you include cameos, huh? Yeah. Because yeah, that's yeah. difficult with yeah. some of these, you know, actors. Like a Bruce Willis will show up sure. all the time. In, in a Ocean's now. 12. Yeah. <laughs> For no apparent reason. And the player. He's the, his scene at the oh, end of the yeah, player yeah, is yeah, great. Yeah, it's great. Okay. Um, so, number two. Meet the parents. So that's two for Ron. Two points. Brings him to six. And uh, coming in at number one, and this is a sad statistic, the number one film for Mr. Robert De Niro is Meet the Fockers. Wow. Oh, my God. Chris, you yeah. screwed me out of tying for first. So you, yeah, Ron and Chris both have six, and Gail takes it home with seven points. Congratulations, yeah. Gail. Ow. Chris, yes. you're working through the holidays. Oh, okay. Again. I didn't think. <laughs> but yeah, the idea was supposed to be that when we got to De Niro, you just all dive all over yes. Godfather, but this savant over here yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is more, yeah. of a, more of a Fokker fan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Never runs with a bet, our Chris <laughs> Chris, what is your favorite film of all time? Oh, Jesus. Um, well, my favorite comedy would be... No, I didn't say favorite no, comedy. Why would you try to break it? Boogie Nights. Genre? Boogie Nights Boogie is Nights, your favorite all night. One. Boogie Nights. That's amazing. You know, it's weird. I don't even know if it's my favorite P.T. Anderson. I know. It's it might true. even be third for me. That's how it would have been big P.T. Anderson. Rank your is. top three, then. Uh, well, first of all, I'm going to go three. Boogie Nights, everybody. Okay. Two. Magnolia, mm-hmm. and number one, there will be blood. Okay, and that's not an attack on Boogie Nights. Yeah. That's how good I think Paul Anderson is. I was obsessed with Magnolia for a while. Me too. Like I could watch it on a loop. Yeah, because it's so long, so much happens in it. Yeah, and then and so many good actors and. But you know, a lot of good. a lot of people hated that when it came out. He yeah. took a lot of shit for it. They don't like people singing, you know, right. just breaking into song. That was one of my but favorite. But it's such things. a good sequence. Yeah, it's so, amazing. And Tom Cruise in that. Mm-hmm. Fucking amazing. Yeah, he's very good in it. 
Gail, what's your uh, Paul Thomas Anderson? Yeah, it's, oh God, it's so hard. But I might put Magnolia as number one. Wow. And then I might say There Will Be Blood 2. And then it's hard because I like I want to say Boogie Nights is three, but then it seems crazy not to have Punch Drunk Love in my top Punch three. Punch Drunk sure. Love is unbelievable. Like, so I think and, we can all agree that The Master is our least favorite. And yet I love it. Yeah. I yeah. fucking love The He's Master. He's a very talented filmmaker. Yeah. I just wish I want him to, you know, Inherent Vice is, uh, I, 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 find it more, Vice. I find it more entertaining every Me time too. I watch it. Like it gets better the more you let go of the idea that you got to treat it more like Big Lebowski. Like none of this yeah. matters. Yeah, what's happening? It's that, more about that. Was about halfway through the movie <laughs> that I was just like, stop stressing about this. Yes, stop, just let like listen to the words and look at the picture. Like that's because I could feel myself being like, I want to love this so bad and I want to know what's going on. And then I was like, okay, yeah. I, I, I will tell you up. though something about that film that it fucking haunts me. That film looks, smells tastes like the exact time period like that feels like the early 70s yeah more than anything i've ever and i don't know how i don't know why i couldn't tell you but the way they're in a diner the way he's in his house where the the house seems like it's more open like there's nothing locked you yeah. know what i mean there's a feeling in that film i can't that it, it fucking haunts me when i'm watching it it's a it's he's such an amazing filmmaker now this next film that he's making with Daniel Day-Lewis has to do with the fashion industry. Daniel Day-Lewis says that he's not going to act anymore. And then I read, someone said that it's because he's going to go into the fashion industry. What? Yeah. That he's he got so, so enamored with yes. it? Because <laughs> he's such a research guy. He's like, I just want to make pants. That's it <laughs> for the rest of my life. Well, that's good. At least he's not like, uh, you know... Uh, decided to beat people with bowling pins for the rest of his life. Exactly. You know what? I might have to drop that movie to three. I might have to put. Wait, what's going on? I yeah, just realized. You're still, you're still, I like it's bugging me, <laughs> yeah. but I feel like now I have to go Magnolia, Punch Drunk Love, and then, um, there will be blood. No there boogie in blood. your time. And, no and, and I love Boogie Nights. Yeah. And right? I love that movie. I bet, you know what? I bet if we all went home and watched Boogie Nights, we were like, oh, we got to move That's, this up. This is I go one. Boogie Nights number one, <laughs> number Magnolia one. number two. And I have long had a soft spot for his very first film. Love that movie. Eight. Hard Eight. Yeah. Hard Eight. AKA Sydney. Sydney. Yeah, me too. I like that movie very much. That is great. John Riley in that movie. Well, John yeah. Riley's, Riley's uh, so good. He's yeah. great in all of his movies. He's unbelievable. Him and P.T. Anderson are a great combo. Uh, but my favorite fucking scene is Philip Seymour Hoffman. Come on, old timer. And he's just <laughs> yeah, such he's a so dick. terrible. He's yeah, such a he's dick. He's awful. He's fucking unbelievable. Like, I feel like I've met that guy in casinos before. Yeah. Like, where does that confidence come from <laughs> right. that that dude has? Where he's no, I want you to stay for a drink. Like he's still, he's like a dick and friendly. God, he's so good. And what about him in Punch Drunk Love, where he's a fucking prick? I know. You know, he's scary. He's so. Yeah. He was so amazingly believable at everything that he's ever done. And, and Gail and I had talked this about this before. When we saw Twister, we thought he was that dude. We were like, oh, he's a weird dude that <laughs> screams a lot. We thought we'd just see him in, you know, Jack Black type comedies. Yeah. You know, the rest of, we didn't know. And yeah. then, but then we finally did, and along came Polly, and he is so goddamn funny in that. It really is. <laughs> the scene where he's like filling in for him in the like board meeting, yeah. and he has no idea what to say at all. So yeah. he's just making a series of noises and spilling yeah. water and just doing all this stupid shit just to, just to keep it going. Yeah. <laughs> so there, and, and the first person to ever say sharded uh, uh, on uh, tape, I believe. Is that right? I think they coined that in that movie. But really? had he already mm -hmm. won his Oscar before he did that? I don't know. It? Because it's such a so. silly <laughs> role. Yeah. yeah. You know, a silly role. I'll tell you something else, too, man. The, that fucking uh, Moneyball. And he's, he's so quiet. so great in Moneyball. And I've played in, like, Dream Weeks and shit, so I've met those kind of managers. He literally is that guy. Yeah. That guy who's just at the end. When he's just, he stands like a baseball manager. Yeah. It's yeah. fucking crazy. But then if you think about, then think about that versus like the other characters we just play. And then think about him in Magnolia. And he's just like so gentle. And well, like, that's what Paul Thomas Anderson said is that uh, that's the, that's what he's, he wrote that part for him. Cause that's the most like 
you know, how he really is. Yeah. That was the closest to Phil's real personality, according to him. My wow. my favorite scene with him in that movie is where he's on the phone and he's just asking me, oh, oh, you do? Mm -hmm. You do have that? Like, there's this weird thing, like, he would ask for something <laughs> yeah. and then think that it was great, that they had it. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, and marble okay. lights. And, it's so... Um, <laughs> yeah. It's so... Like, you're like, oh, fuck, I've stood next to people wondering who they were talking to. Why they did that before. He's fucking amazing. And then in that movie, he's on the phone at different points with... Uh, Mary Lynn Rice Cub and uh, Paul F. Tompkins. Yeah. Yeah. Are they? Uh, <laughs> the actual people the, that were cut on the other side of the is phone. Is that right? Yeah, like. They filmed them, yeah, yeah. And they just decided just to use the voices. Yeah. Wow. Which is pretty effective because they're real, especially with Tompkins, it's like a really long phone call. Yeah. yeah. And so it's really interesting. You never see the person on the other end. This is the first time I've ever mm -hmm. heard that before. <laughs> um, and then he shows up in, in There Will Be Blood. Yeah, uh, just wearing his regular clothes. From yes, home. Yeah, that's, that's how he got the part. And it was like, Paul, can you just drive to set? Yeah, can you just As put it. on anything that you own. I, I would actually say this, and this is the honest God truth. If I owned a movie studio and I just got it tomorrow, I would call Paul Tompkins and go, "Give me whatever you want to do. Let's mm -hmm. just let's just let you be you." Yeah, because I think he's so fucking great. I love him. Yeah, he sort of needs like a Louis C.K. kind of uh, situation. Right. He can just do, here, here, Paul, here's some money, do something. Do whatever you want to do. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think he would He would come up with something great. Yeah, there's no doubt. There's like zero doubt that he would come up with something that would be unique and, and watchable. Doug Benson's in studio. Doug Loves Movies is happening this Sunday, July 2nd at the Improv in Kansas City, Missouri. Go to DougLovesMovies.com for tickets and all additional dates on Twitter at Doug Benson. Uh, we got to go to this uh, thing, Chris. Yes, the Laughing 50th Anniversary Special with George Slaughter. Uh, this is me and George Slaughter sitting down watching clips of Laughing and him kind of doing a, a producer's cut of it 50 years after. And some of the comedy on this, it's shocking how little the news has changed. They were like the right versus the left, military spending versus helping the poor, uh, women being, you know, blacks. It's just, it's, it, it could be, the show could be done today and nobody would know the difference. It's embarrassing for America. <laughs> Uh, Doug, you're Somebody great. would complain about the bathing suits. <laughs> yes. That yes, yes. That there's go-go dancers. That's true. They wrote on that woman, and it's disgusting. <laughs> um, you know what's great, Doug? We had you on the show today, and no one quit. This is a first <laughs> for Doug Benson. There's no controversy, just movie talk. You're the best, buddy. Thanks for having See me. See you next time. Bye. Join Sirius XM's Ron Bennington in conversation with the show's iconic creator and producer... Nobody auditioned. Rick Buzzy never auditioned. Goldie never auditioned. George Schlotter. Gary Owens I hired in the men's room at the smokehouse. For a look back at Laugh-In. We're here with George Slaughter, and it is 50 years since uh, Laugh-In went on the air, and you can pick up the box set of Laugh-In, 50th anniversary of the show, June 15th. Uh, great to see you again, my friend. Nice to see you, young fellow. You know, you uh, you look back on this. Does it feel like 50 years to you? No, no, no. it feels like yesterday. It, the image of all of that is so indelibly planted on in my brain that I remember every moment. We put together that 50 years, 144 shows, and uh, they just did a clip collection, and it was amazing. I looked at it, and the girl who edited it was, jokes are difficult to cut. You cut too soon, you cut too late, it ruins it. Well, this girl they have working for put together this thing, and I looked at it. This is rare. It was a 30-minute clip package, and I couldn't make one suggestion. It was just perfect. And the only thing I did is I told them they ought to run a thing on the bottom of it. What you're looking at is only one third of the available collection. But she took it all out of there. Just wonderful. It is a phenomenal to look back on something and feel like we did it, right? We pulled it off. Yes, we did. Yeah. Uh, against all odds, because it wasn't supposed to work. It was on opposite Lucille Ball and Gunsmoke, which were the number one and two shows. And they only put it on because they had nothing else to, to throw away. So the first year we were only on for 14 shows because it took them that long to get a replacement ready. So it came on here and exploded, and they didn't know what to do. Now, uh, 
Rowan and Martin were the kind of centerpiece of that show, and you saw them in, Ve- in Vegas the first yeah, they time. Worked. I, I did a thing with Edie Adams when Ernie died. I did her night by back. And then uh, the show was not planned to have a host. The show was just planned to happen. And then uh, Timex said they would buy it, but they had to have a host. And Rowan and Martin were older than the rest of the cast, and they wore tuxedos, and they interfered with that tumult less than anybody. And they did a hell of a nightclub act. They were really, really funny. So and, pu- putting them in helped it. They added Dan was straight. You know, he was funny, but he was a straight man, and Dick was kind of crazy. He was a go-between Dan and the crazies, and uh, it worked. It worked well. And Dan had kind of grown up in show business, right? He was uh, a bartender. Yeah. And uh, and Dick was a used car salesman. And, and they, uh, one, one of them was a used car salesman, I forget. But they got together, and uh, Noonan and Marshall did an act. And they loaned them the material to do the first Rowan and Martin. And Peter Marsh is still mad about the fact they took their act. But they 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 were just doing they were a nightclub act, but they worked for this because the other people were crazy. Dan was straight and Dick well, it was a go between. Well let's listen to a little bit of Rowan and Martin together. Certainly restless out there this evening. You looking uh, forward to the show tonight, are you? Yeah. What's the movie? (laughs) What movie? Hmm? You do do. It's laughing. Oh, that's right. Laughing's on tonight. I almost forgot it was Tuesday. (laughs) Tuesday. It's Monday. Glad you reminded me. Don't forget to watch uh, Laugh-In tomorrow night. It's not on tomorrow night. Finally cancel it, huh? I told you they couldn't keep it up every week. (laughs) You heard it here first. No, here. Back there. You heard it here first. You knew who couldn't keep what up every week? Funk and Wagner. Turn on Laugh-In. See, I told you they couldn't keep it up. Uh, You're getting me confused. Let's go back to the beginning. Well, in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, there was this boy and this girl. Do you and mind if we don't a... go back quite that far? Let's go back to the beginning of the show. Okay. The following NBC. Hey, was that Funkin' Wagner? That was the NBC Peacock. That's how our show starts. Yeah, that's what I've been trying to tell you. This is our show. Oh, you mean it's Tuesday already? No, it's Monday. Laughing is on Monday nights. Well, somebody better tell Funkin' Wagner they're going to be late for the show. <laughs> And that's the way you started every week. Well, not quite that way. That that was another problem. NBC <laughs> said, you can't air anything that confuses the air date and the time. I said, but it, it works. It's funny. He said, well, no, you can't. The audience will get confused. I said, the audience is already confused on Monday night because nobody's watching NBC. <laughs> so <laughs> everybody's watching Lucy. So so we went in on, on the air with that thing confusing the air date and the time. And uh, it worked, but NBC was very NBC was nervous all the time. So, and so at that point, you're like, okay, this is this thing works. This is really starting to work because you're, you know, you're sitting in your studio in LA. You're not being able. You can't hear the laughter the way you can in a nightclub or a theater. But you no, start we, to catch we didn't on. Have an audience. We had an audience that would come in twenty five people at a time. It built the NBC tour because we had to have an audience so that we had the, the feeling of a presence. But there was no way an audience was going to sit there for the 12 hours it took to tape. It. Yeah. And so we kept changing audiences. And one time we'd have all nuns. One time we'd have all hospital victims. And they would sit there. And so the laughs were different. But we had some people there all the time. And then for the big thing, the cocktail party, we had a full audience. Because you just needed that energy. You needed we that. We needed that energy. We needed that feel, that the presence of people. And people wanted to come. But mm-hmm. there was just no room. You know, we had the building was full of scenery and props. We had one whole studio full of props. So we had knives and guns and swords and everything <laughs> you might need. You know, when you brought up Pygmy, uh, you seem to have an appreciation of comedy of all different kinds. Oh, yeah. uh, well, where that's did the that... root. That's the root of humor. Yeah. I mean, there is a definite black style of humor. Uh, uh, see... The, the, in the ghetto, in the, in the neighborhood, the guys to impress the girls didn't have cars, they didn't have money, they didn't have clothes. What they had was language. And so that's why the, the black language arose. And the, the way of saying things, the inversion. When the guy left the Basie band, he said, Count, in four weeks we will have been gone too. <laughs> it was his way of giving two weeks notice. And that the color of the black language. And so it was very, very rich. And then we used that a lot. And Jewish. Jewish humor was the other root of 
And this is something you even picked up on as a kid, long before you got in the show business. This is something you had an appreciation for. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, we lived for a while in East St. Louis. I would think I was the last white guy out of East St. Louis. And it was it was very it was a cultural <laughs> awakening. Yeah. And uh um and that had a big effect on me. And we, we did a lot of that. Including like with Red Fox's first time he was ever allowed on network television. And, and which is amazing, right? To think it took him that long. Well, to, the, he was dirty. Yeah. Red Fox was, you know, and uh, but I, I mean, I really liked Red Fox because he was funny. And I said yeah. to NBC, we did an all black, first all black variety show. And so I told NBC, I said, "Want to bring in Red Fox?" He said, "You can't. He can't go on the air." I said, "We will let him tape whatever he wants, and then we'll just edit what's acceptable." And we did, and Red became a big, big hit. It's a uh, 50th year anniversary of Laugh-In. Uh, one of the first big breakout stars went on to become probably the biggest movie star in the world was Goldie Hawn. Oh, yeah. And uh, let's play a clip of Goldie. Take it away, Goldie! ta -da! What's the news across the nation? Go, Goldie. I'd love to hear more, but you've already done that. It's time to introduce me. Oh, Dan Rowan, I'd like you to be Goldie Hawn. No, no, no. I've met you before. You remember? I know. Yeah, the future. <laughs> I took. Oh, I took a wonderful. I took a wonderful memory course last week. I mean, last August. <laughs> or is it last week? <laughs> Goldie, not only are you delightful. Yes. But you're unforgettable. Who, who is? <laughs> Yes, I'm Irving Lazar. Well, congratulations, Irving. Your wife just presented you with a baby boy, George Jr. <laughs> I don't get it. And now, with the news of the future, 20 years from now, here's Dan. <laughs> that was terrible, Goldie. Shape up. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me extreme pleasure to and diminished gratification. <laughs> With the complexities of Circumum. Oh, thank you. An auditory delight. <laughs> well, I have some good news and some bad news. First, I fell down five flights of stairs. And now for the bad news. I went right by the floor I wanted. Boom. <laughs> well, the memories of that child. Yeah, she's something, huh? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. What was interesting is that uh, she that laugh was was natural, I and mean, it was. And what would happen is we would do things deliberately to confuse her, and then when she realized she was getting lost, she just started to laugh, and the whole world started to laugh. But there probably, you know, wasn't uh, another show that that would have worked on. They would have stopped her. They would have tried to. Oh, the, the know, network. Fix the her. network told me at one point. They said, "You tell that little blonde girl she hasn't gotten right, anything right yet, <laughs> and she can be." I said, "Oh, I'll go over and tell her right away." <laughs> oh, sure, I'll rush over. But what, what was interesting is that uh, they've come to me and they wanted to do a whole show of outtakes of Golden outtakes and this thing. I said, are you nuts? We aired the outtakes. How, that was the show with the outtakes. And uh, uh, and so you think I've got a room full of Goldie Hawn goofing up? And uh, nobody could ever believe that it was not written. It was just automatic. It was just an accident. But also, Dan and Dick played so well with her, and they their timing helped her yeah. get her silliness out there. Well, they they loved her. Yeah. And you, you had to love the Goldie. Yeah. Today, I mean, we saw her at her star ceremony with her daughter. And uh, you had to love that purely innocent child with no anger, no venom. She just would come on stage and the, uh, the world just uh, collapsed when they saw her. Yes, it, it is and true. She wasn't a comic. Goldie had been a dancer. Yeah. And when we brought her on the show, she said, but I don't, what do you want me to do? I said, Goldie, I don't know what I want you to do, but I just want you to be there. So we gave her an introduction of Dan and she screwed it up so bad that uh, <laughs> we started doing it regularly. We would invert the words on the, go on the cue cards. And we would, uh, Ruth would make rude noises while she was trying to talk, and she never got a chance. 
<laughs> that was great. But she also was that it girl. You know, she was in the zeitgeist. It was interesting that she was kind of thought of as this California girl when she was a Jewish kid from New Jersey who yeah. came out here. But she caught what was ever happening in the late 60s. She did. And uh, that whole feeling about it, it was not like unlike today. Mm -hmm. You know, there was uh, all of the same problems we have today. We had then. You had an unpopular president, an unpopular war. You had uh, the battle between the ages and the gay rights and the, you know, <laughs> abortion and all of that stuff. Same problems we have today, which is kind of sad when you realize we haven't fixed anything. No, it is really true. It's been a 50-year fight at least, and it's the same thing. The right and left just despise right. each other. And But the thing is with laughing is it was so fast, you really didn't know you were offended until three jokes later. Right. And uh, <laughs> we... Uh, and the networks had, we put six sensors in the home. I mean, they just sat there like, you know, watching, watching like police. And they always took out the wrong thing. I think that that's just, that had to be the toughest job in the world to it be a was, censor. It was a ball. <laughs> yeah. was, we, we put things in there that we knew they were going to cut and they'd leave it in. It was, these guys would come and say, what did he say? And of course, you know, uh, Alan, well, then Artie, Artie Johnson, who I just love. Uh, mm -hmm. Artie Johnson was a linguist. He would make up things that sounded like French, sounded like Italian. They would bring in translators to figure out what it was that Artie had said. And, uh, you know, it wasn't anything wrong with it. It just sounded like it. It was. just sounded like something bad was happening. That's but, right. That's right. We uh, would sit there. With, they would come with a book full of, of uh, paper clips, and we'd have these long meetings. And while we were having a meeting on what we had to cut, we were on stage shooting what they wanted to cut. And then by the time it was over, <laughs> we had it on tape and went on the air. But once it was a hit, it was such an enormous hit that, uh, I mean, I'm arrogant now, but 50 years ago, geez, you couldn't talk with a 50 share. Forget, about it. <laughs> forget it. Forget it. <laughs> I, was, I was murdered. <laughs> that, that changes you quick, though, that kind of success. A man by the name of Herb Schlosser was head of NBC, and they would go to talk to Herb Schlosser and say, look, Here's what he's doing now. You can't do this and you can't do that. And Herb Schlosser says, I'll talk to him, you know. And then he calls and says, George, they're complaining. Do just what you're doing. Yes. <laughs> Keep Herb that Schlosser 50 share. Herb was greatly responsible for the freedom that we had. Uh, here is some more Goldie Hawn. And now, here's Dale with the news of the future. Berlin, 20 years from now, 1989. There was dancing in the streets today as East Germany finally tore down the Berlin Wall. Joy was short-lived, however, as the wall was quickly replaced with a moat full of alligators. <laughs> Item, Washington, D.C., 1988. President Ronald Reagan today denied once again that he is a candidate for the office of governor of California. <laughs> Dublin, 1988. With marriage in the church recently sanctioned, the archbishop and his lovely bride, <laughs> Sister Mary Catherine, said... This time it's for keeps. <laughs> California, 1988. Racial discrimination was finally eliminated in Los Angeles today when the smog became so dense that it was impossible to determine anyone's color. <laughs> News of the future, Washington, D.C., two years from now. While leaving his office today, Ralph Nader suffered a broken ankle when his left leg gave out from under him. He immediately launched a suit against his mother and father, charging faulty production. <laughs> News of the future, New York, 1991. The United Nations today met an emergency session over the growing hostility between its only remaining member. A motion was made to withdraw from the UN, but it was tabled by a vote of one to nothing. The uh, News of the future, some of that actually well, came, came true, true, right? It came yeah. true, it came true. And uh, uh, that was also always a problem. But we were saying, look, we're not saying it happened. <laughs> we would also, we, we finally hit on a way that we could get a lot of things said. He said, there's no truth to the rumor that, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, we would make up stuff and then say, and deny it, deny that it was true. But, you know, when you're, when you have that many punchlines, the writers, you must have just been pushing them constantly yeah, for new we material. We had 15 writers under the direction of Digby Wolf. And they would come in there Monday morning and write the cocktail party jokes. And then they just wrote and wrote. Alan, uh, I mean, Don Rio was there. He's still a big, big, important yeah. writer. And uh, they they all became important writers because there was just such a need for so much material. When they got through with a season of laughing, they, they, the skill was honed. 
How many episodes were you doing a, a year then, George? Is it 24. 24 yeah, yeah. a year. And uh, there was a sign on my wall, and it said, if you don't have a punchline, don't come in here. Mm. And then it said, if it's more than a minute and a half long, it better be really funny. And so they had to write it so tight, you know, and uh, and th that, that didn't exist before. They, everything was kind of much more leisurely. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, quite frankly, when you even watch like Saturday Night Live to this day, uh, as the show moves along, it gets tougher and tougher and the, the sketches feel longer. But you were against that. You were just let's get to punchlines as fast one, as we one can. Michaels was one of the writers. We mm -hmm. brought him down from Canada he and uh, Hart Pomerantz and uh, uh, Dan and Dick loved Lauren Michaels. He was, a, you know, he would sit in the dressing room with him and he would write some of that monologue stuff mm -hmm. and he but he always resented the fact that it was had to be so short which he never did get over that right, right. everything had to be under a minute and every and it had to have a punchline and a lot of the stuff in Saturday Night I love Saturday Night Live and yeah. I'm glad it's on for 40 years that's great because it is one window but it's the only window I yeah think other, you know we have Bill Maher and we have uh, <clears throat> Rachel Maddow and we have uh, you know Stephanie Miller yeah uh, but we don't have as much as we used to have. And that's always been your thing. You love variety. You love yeah. a show that yeah. moves. I love that, and I love I love the battle. I love the hand <laughs> combat <laughs> with the networks, the sponsors, the censors. It was great fun. So you enjoy all of those things. A lot of things that drive people out of the business, you're like, no, this is a game. This is a challenge this that I can play. This is, this is a game. It's yeah. like a, and uh, it's a game with big winning, but... Uh, uh, and the, the interesting thing is it, it is difficult, but it is fun. So there's a very special breed of writers and a special breed of performers. And uh, uh, you've got to have a place to put it. When you realize today, the interesting thing is there is no feel-good television. The reason why they're bringing back a lot of the older shows is those shows made you feel good. And uh, now you have the, uh, the entertainer, you have uh, the voice, and you have some of the you know the, those shows that are talent. But as far as the, the content shows, it's all angry. It's all car, car explosions and yeah. gunfights and so forth. And there was an island of <laughs> one hour a week where you felt good. And even then, we didn't have that much. You feel good television. Yeah, and you have to put it in context. It, in the late 60s, you had you know, great political leaders being murdered. You had riots. Yeah, same you had, as now. Yeah, you had the Vietnam War. But you guys found a way to kind of walk that tightrope. And it was brief. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and our, Dick sent me a thing once and said, our safety is in our, spe our speed. Because yeah. nobody really got it until two jokes later. And they said, what did they say? Yeah. By then... Interestingly enough, little kids saw the the Goldie and the bikinis and the, the lights and the yeah. colors and the trap doors and water. And then older people just love seeing all those young people having a good time. But the ones in between were the ones who were actually using it almost as a news item. I mean, they, yeah. they got a lot of the political and the social satire uh, from laughing. And they became aware because they weren't watching the news. And now, of course, you have now a wall-to-wall -wall news. Yeah. And they call it fake news. Mm -hmm. I call it Fox. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, God, there we go. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, you always have... Uh, I, I've seen you a couple of times do Neil Cavuto's show. Yes. And you make him a nervous wreck, because oh, yeah. he knows it's coming. First time he wanted me to come on the show, and I had never been on the show, and mm -hmm. we'd never meet in a minute. So what do you want me to talk about? He said, well, we'll, we'll get there. So when I got there, he said... Uh, it was after the Janet Jackson wardrobe incident, you know, and he said, uh, did I feel as the first person to have pushed the envelope uh, responsible for the Janet Jackson one? <laughs> and I said, yes, I probably am responsible. And Neil went for it. And I said, however, because Fox has run that clip over and over and over and still frame and zoomed in and whatever over and over worldwide and thereby having made Janet Jackson's right breast, the most famous <laughs> boob on television since Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> and I was off, man. Yeah. <laughs> and Bill Cosby called me and said, man, they don't throw white people off that path. <laughs> but Neil and I then became fam you know, friends. And every time he'll invite me on, he said, now, George, you're not going to annoy me. <laughs> but then I always, always give him a little zapper. <laughs> yeah. I like Neil. And, but, of course, my favorite is Sean Hannity because I'm a, I'm a masochist. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, uh, Bill O'Reilly. I miss Bill O'Reilly. Yeah. I'm the only one that missed him. I mean, but he, can you imagine? I mean, it took him nine years. The first 
sexual harassment was nine years ago, and they paid a huge sum of money then. It took them nine years to figure out that it was a it was a habit. Learn so the learning curve was, was <laughs> slow. Well, probably was was a cliff. <laughs> you know. uh, this is a another discovery of yours that went on to become uh, a major star, Lily Tomlin, uh, and uh, she is one of a kind to this yes, day. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're well. There's no place for them. I, I, mm. If there was another Lily Tomlin, which I doubt there is, I don't know where they would be because Lily came in, and I had seen her doing an audition when I got in a show that was canceled, one of the many cancellations I've had. And there was a girl on stage doing a barefoot tap dance with taps taped to her feet. And I loved her, but I could never find her. And then one day I heard her doing a thing of a, a, a rubber freak, a woman who ate rubber, loved rubber. And she was cured. And then she thanked the psychiatrist and threw herself and, and ate his galoshes. You know, so, <laughs> but I saw this woman and, I, and she came to the office and we sat there for three hours, and she did every character she did. It was endless wealth of the people and the characters. And so we, I said, I want you to do the show. And she said, when do we do the show? I said, we're going to do them all. Mm -hmm. And it was at that point, nobody auditioned. I, no, none of the cast of Laughter. Which is unbelievable. No, nobody, they didn't know who she was. And here was this girl. And um, she came in, and the first character we did was Ernestine, the telephone operator. And we dressed her for the first time. And <clears throat> Lily, who is brilliant i mean she's such a great actress and with a sense of humor and then uh she went to do ernestine and i said hold it hold it lily when you dial the phone dial with the middle finger so <laughs> when you see ernestine <laughs> you'll see her going <laughs> one ringy dingy to it we wish nobody ever realized she was giving the finger to the universe with ernestine but that woman is brilliant she is one of a kind i don't think Gilda Radner came close, mm -hmm. but Lily was just a barrage of characters. And, uh, and, and Gilda, of course, grew up on Lily watching sure. that show. So this is uh, a little Lily Tomlin as uh, Ernestine. Hey now, Frank Sinatra. Sinatra. Oh, I've torn some Ma Bell property. Let's see. S, S. Oh, here it is. And the yellow page is under swingers. <laughs> One ring a ding ding. Two ring a ding ding. A oh, gracious good afternoon. Is this the Sinatra residence? Are, are you his maid? Oh, oh, you're his girl Friday. Well, what about Saturday and Sunday? A little phone company humor for swinging lovers, sweetie. So why don't you put Frankie Boy on? A oh, gracious good afternoon. Is this Mr. Frank Sinatra? Oh, Mr. Sinatra, this is Miss Tomlin of the telephone company. And, oh, why, thank you. Why, thank you so much for asking, but I don't have a bird. <laughs> She's amazing. NBC, NBC always questioned Frank, Frank Sinatra's bird. And, and Frank loved her, yeah. by the way. Oh, well, everybody loved Lily. Uh, but also, you listen back then, you forget the phone company was like the most powerful company right. in the world That's right. at and, the time. And she just struck terror in their hearts, <laughs> you know, because they were overcharging and they yes. were doing. And of course, then we knew they were taping, you know, which I guess they're still doing that. I yes, don't know, I don't know <laughs> their own way. News this morning, but I would guess so. <laughs> but she, Lily Tomlin, was, was a delight. I mean, she would come in. Sit in the room, and she's very, very, she's quite serious when she works on those characters because, because those characters are real people. That Edith Ann mm -hmm. came in one day and she said, I want to do a little girl. So I said, Me too. No, I, I, <laughs> I, I didn't say that. I didn't, I didn't say that. Bill O'Reilly said that. Uh, but anyhow, she came in and she would work on a character endlessly, and then we would go on stage and tape it. And if it worked, we'd use it, and if it didn't work, we'd, we didn't use it. So she had total freedom. And out of her came these characters. She said she wanted to do a little girl. And I said, okay. So she said, but I want a chair. I said, I'll get you a chair. She said, no, I want a big chair. So we built that gigantic chair with Edith Ann. And uh, her characters are really people. They're not. Yeah. You know, and when we would cast the show, we wouldn't cast it Lily. We would cast it Edith Ann. We'd cast it Ernestine. And uh, same with Ruth Buzzy. Ruth yeah. Buzzy was another one. She 
was a avalanche of characters. What a lovely woman she is. But there is something so unique and strange about that kind of talent that, that like you said, there's seriousness about this. And then uh, later in life, you met Robin Williams, yeah. and he and Lily always kind of reminded me yeah. of each other. The, the, the thing is that they needed a window. When they cast a show now, first of all, the auditions are endlessly, and they're auditioning for people. Some of the people they audition for are actually brain dead. I mean, they, mm -hmm. you wonder, how did they ever do this? I love them, and they're bright, and they, we need them. <laughs> but <laughs> but but they'll they'll they told me once tell a little blonde girl to to get her lines right she yeah. hasn't gotten anything right yet so of that's all tell her right away yeah that's the kind of people that you were dealing with on a daily basis it was uh, they needed to find somebody and mm -hmm. I needed to find them so it yeah. was a marriage that was destined to happen and uh, when we saw them you you would know you'd say oh wait a minute that's that's good. I wasn't always right but I was right fairly frequently. And it had to be exciting when you gave somebody that opportunity yeah. and then watch them run with it. You know, well, watch Robin, them. Robin. See, you have to you have to allow for accident. I, I'm here because of accidents. I mean, this, this didn't actually wasn't planned. Yeah. <laughs> so, so many things went wrong that it worked. But I was up in San Francisco and I saw Robin uh, working on the street, with the Holy City Zoo, and then I went to see him in. Uh, a little club in the west side of Los Angeles, and he was in coveralls and a straw hat barefoot. And uh, he hung the microphone out over the audience and said, I'm fishing for assholes. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Robin, come see me tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. So he came in the office, and he was, you know, he looked like he'd been slept in, you know. And I said, Robin, you get cleaned up, and I've got a job for you. So about three days later, he showed up. I'm ready to work, boss. And he came in. And we would just, every time we stopped, we would give Robin a table full of hats or props or something. One of the most brilliant comedy minds ever. But here again, he needed the window. Yes. You know, the same as Lily. He needed mm -hmm. the window. Ruth, they all need, Artie Johnson needed that window. They needed somebody to say, go for it, do it. And that doesn't exist today. But do you think it's because you had a chance to work with Jonathan Winters yeah. when, years before that you're like, okay, some of these, some of this genius doesn't fit into the regular slots. That's why it works. Yeah. I mean, Jonathan Winters was, uh, you know, he was, uh, he was a bit of an adventure. That's yeah. Say about Jonathan and yeah, Carney. but I, I could. Lo I, I love these stories. I love hearing about winners. Well, we, yeah, we were doing the first Jonathan Winters show called The Wild Winners Night, and the guest star was Art Carney. And the idea was we were going to do Morty Frickett's 100th birthday. And uh, after we read the script the first time, we came out of the meeting and we heard that Kennedy had been shot. So nobody showed up for a week. I mean, uh, Dwight was drunk, Art Carney, Jonathan even fell off the wagon. I had a beverage or two. And uh, so we came in to do the show, and we had no rehearsal. So it was an absolute disaster. I mean, nothing worked at all. Art tried to actually jump on Marty, and he said, mm -hmm. he touched my body, you know. And so so what I did was I got every prop in the building, and I took tables, and I said, now here, just play. And what they did, they stood on stage and just did prop jokes. And then they, they network, and Dwight Hammond said, what are we going to do with this? And I don't know. We're going to deliver a show, or I don't get paid. So we edited all of those bits together just jump cuts and then put that at the network wanted to see what we were doing so we ran it for them and they laughed they said but now what's the show i said that's the show they said but that's not a show i said that's a show it's the biggest thing in europe is called comedy verte I love it. <laughs> that's, that's great and they'd never heard of it but they aired it and won a tv guide award but that the the the, uh, the actual luck is in recovering from a mistake yes it's an accident accidents are my favorite, my, my favorite. And you were able to do that for, in that case, Jonathan Winters, Goldie Hawn, Lily, Robin. Just There's something about you that... We were able to do that with William Buckley. Yeah, yes, right. <laughs> I mean, we, did, we did jokes on the other side. Yeah. And I invited William Buckley. He kept saying, no, he, not only do I refuse to appear, I resent having been asked. Well, <laughs> stop it, you know. So I then sent him a note and I said, I said we, we really want you on the show. And we will have you flown to California in a plane with two right wings. And that got him to do the show. Well, we're talking about some of this uh, brilliance. And this is a short piece of a guest star, Peter Sellers, oh, yeah. on the show. Another one of those people Another that absolute. we're talking about. Yeah, just an amazing talent. Who knows where that comes from? So this is Peter Sellers, I think, with Goldie on Laughing. Uh, Mr. Peter Sellers, how do you play cricket? 
Well, Goldie, darling, it's very difficult to sum up in a few words. It's a game that involves, say, 11 men fielding, two batsmen, and a bowler. The idea is that the bowler should hit one of the wickets, and the uh, batsman stands in front of the wicket, and when the bowler is sent to him rather fast or rather slow, depending, of course, whether the bowler is a fast or slow bowler, he hits it as hard as he can to leg or a forward drive through the men in order to take as many runs as the two batsmen can make. They run forward like this, and then the men try and throw the ball back and hit the man all the way through. That's roughly what it's like. Hmm. That's funny, huh? That's the way we elect a president. That is amazing that you get a Peter Sellers as a guest star as well, right? Oh, yeah, well, it was a marriage made in heaven. I, mean, I went to... London and met Peter Sellers, and uh, he just, well, first of all, when anybody saw Goldie Hawn one time, or Lily Tomlin, or Ruth or Joanne, they wanted to work with him, and so Peter came over. That thing he did wasn't written. It was right. just ad-libbed. So much of the show was ad-libbed. So much of the show was accident, and uh, uh, Peter Sellers was that. We wound up very, very good friends. Well, he ended up doing a, a movie with Goldie a couple of years yeah, yeah, later, yeah. which is, uh, I mean, it's kind of amazing when you think, here's this kid, and she's doing jokes, and the biggest stars in the world are falling in love with her, the biggest directors, producers, and they wanted her to do everything. And her and Sellers together, I mean, that's that's priceless. You have that, and, and Lily, Lily's a huge motion picture yes. star now, really, and they they came on stage and would look at Lily Tomlin and couldn't believe what they were seeing. That what we gave them was a, an arena. We gave them a playpen, and then we would tape things. We would try things. We would cut it, and we we aired a lot of the mistakes. I had a really good time. Sure. Well, you also made it fun for everybody yeah. before you not know. Not for the network. No, not for the network. They but it. it was the most expensive moment. The most expensive commercials <laughs> on television were on Laughing. And so then we made fun of the sponsors. And the network says, you can't make fun of them. I said, yes, we can. And we thought for sure they would pull out. They wanted to stay with the with the show. And they would let us say anything. Well, And you had enemies, right? There were people who attacked the, oh, attacked yeah. the show. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Be well, the right wing attack. Mm -hmm. you know? But then we got them, too. Dr. Billy Graham came right. on. He said, the family who watches laughing together really needs to pray together. Well, that was a major get for us, you know? Yeah. And uh, uh, it was a golden opportunity. I just wish today there was some place. We may do Laughing again. Laughing's going to air the 144 shows. We just you run some of those clips. Yeah, are as topical today as they were then. So we're talking about doing a new Laughing, and uh, uh, when we do, we're going to have to knock down some of the same barriers. Mm -hmm. But a lot of those, a lot of those were made easier now because we did a show called uh, Real People. Yes. And Real People was the first celebration of the unsung hero, was the first celebration of the eccentric. We, we, in England, they celebrated eccentrics. We hid them. Mm -hmm. well, on Real People, we brought the eccentrics into the mainstream. And so we're going to do Real People again on, on Amazon, releasing Real People, 144 episodes. So it's kind of an adventure for an alta cocker like me who's yeah. barely hanging on, about to take a dirt nap, to have, <laughs> to have laugh in coming back. And to have real people, and have you even know, what are you, nine years old? Yes, I'm nine and a stuff? half. Uh, <laughs> but I, but you have a love for the eccentrics. That's something, yeah. whether it's in comedy or... There has been the opinion that I could be one myself. Yeah. I, I wanted to be, I couldn't pass the physical. <laughs> I couldn't pass the written exam. But there's an embrace of that fighting sure, against the sure. norm. Well, I like you. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, another guest star... Uh, and who was, uh, of course, the biggest TV star at the time, Johnny Carson. Yeah. And he was also a fan of Laugh-In and a fan of the entire cast. Oh, yeah. Well, one time, Dick Martin got very upset with us because Goldie and Lily were getting so much space, you know, in the newspaper. And so to, to show me, he wouldn't show up. He didn't come in. And so uh, I went across the hall and they said, Johnny, do me a favor. Come over and read Dick's cards. So Dan and Dick did... The routine, but instead of Dick, it was Johnny Carson. And uh, so then three weeks later, Dan got upset with us, and he said, we're neither one coming in. So I said, oh, my God. So I took, took Goldie Hawn and Teresa, and I had them read Rowan and Martin's cards, and they thought it was a stroke of genius. It was just a desperation. <laughs> yeah. Hail Mary shot. Uh, this is just a quick clip of Johnny Carson. Oh, he was a delight. On laughing. 
Doing the laughing show is my second favorite thing in the whole world. My first is having an unclean yak sit on my dinner. <laughs> Just having him uh, like the show had to be amazing. Oh, yeah, you. it was. And he was yeah. across the hall. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that they could come over and in two minutes do enough stuff for three shows. Right. And uh, Johnny loved the show. It was the only, like, freewheeling place on television. Now, I'm concerned about television now. And that's one of the reasons we're bringing laughing back in real people is because... You look at television, you don't really feel good. You sometimes don't even feel clean. It's just like so much junk and so many people. So uh, some of that stuff will cycle because we have the same problems. We haven't solved anything in the, in the 50 years. We have the same problems, some of the same people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we bring back real people and we bring back laughing. There's a good chance that it will happen again. And uh, if it does... And I'm still around, you know, I'm not... <laughs> well, you'll go out and look for all new young people to do this with, you'll... Strangely enough, they find me now. Yeah. You know, I mean, in the market, they find me, they find me in the gas station, because I'm a magnet. I mean, these people who are don't fit anywhere else are exactly what I'm looking for as a yeah. rule. I was thinking, you know who else had that uh, at a different age was like uh, P.T. Barnum. You know what I mean? He would bring in people that didn't fit in anywhere else in life, and suddenly there would be this sideshow of and this camaraderie together. Well, in the circus, yeah. right? My attraction when I was a kid in the circus was always in the sideshow. Yeah, me because too. Because then, you know, Wanda the Wonderful will reveal to you the eighth and ninth wonders of the world. Stand yeah. back that guy, that Barker, uh, had a big effect on me. And uh, uh, today, what we've done are sideshows. The main ring with the aerial acts and so forth never really interested me as much as the guys talking <laughs> slices, dices, chops. Yeah. Well, you've found some of the most amazing oddities in the world for these shows. It's just tremendous. Let's go to uh, another one. And uh, this is Tim Conway, who had stopped in to do something with Cher, uh, kind of unplanned. <laughs> yep. Well, it's been a few years, John Smith, since they had your head on the chopping block. How you been getting along? Real fine, Dan. Real fine here at the reservation. You know, as a matter of fact, the Indians even have a little name for me now. Oh, really? Yeah. They call me Running Chicken. <laughs> When'd you get that name? Uh, right after they put my head on that chopping block. <laughs> and Pocahontas? Yes, I do. <laughs> you did a very brave thing throwing yourself in front of John before he was hit with the club. Wasn't brave was dumb. Oh, well, see, she took the brunt of the blow. Yeah, I see. It still hurts when it rains. Yeah. What line are you in, John? I'm with uh, National Navajo now. It's uh, communications. Uh, we make smoke signals and wet blankets and so forth. Right now, we're working on a huge signal. See, and we're going to float it right over L.A. and then just kind of leave it there forever. Yeah, what, uh, that, that's a position of some importance, isn't it? Top of the totem pole. <laughs> <laughs> Local joke, Dan. Yes. <laughs> it was two days before the network understood that. <laughs> but I love Tim Conway. Yes, there was uh, uh, there were things that when he could walk on that show and seemed like he was a regular oh, immediately. Yeah. Uh, well, Tim Conway is a regular wherever he goes. He's a delightful human being, and uh, we did a tribute to Tim Conway one night, and uh, everybody in town was there and so forth. And his acceptance speech—you never knew what Tim was going to do. Yeah, the show they taped was not the show they aired. The show that they then stayed afterwards and did Tim Conway's version. And uh, But in his, his acceptance speech, he thanked everybody, and then he thanked his lovely wife, Sharky, and he said, and uh, she takes such good care of me. As a matter of fact, she has me eating so much fiber, I'm starting to pass wicker furniture. <laughs> Come on, help me. You know, you, you know, from, there you just, from there you put the ca cameras away and you just wait till the audience leaves because... Starting to pass wicker furniture. <laughs> Just the image of this. You know, I love him. He's a genius. And that's also, you know, we're talking about your shows, but your private life has been filled with these eccentrics <laughs> let's not, and let's fun not go people. There, yeah. champ. <laughs> <laughs> but you have had some of the great friendships over the years. Yes. Sinatra, Sammy Davis Jr. Yeah. And the Sinatra was a piece of work. I mean, <laughs> I loved him so much. And he was, there were different Sinatras. You never knew for sure who was going to show up. But whatever it was going to be, it was, it was, it was exciting. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I, I did a lot of things with him. It's It's got to be tremendous when you sit back and just think about some of these things. Accident. Accident. You know, yeah, accident. Always accident. He, uh, 
you had to think on your feet. He called me crazy because mm. I would come in with different things. Did I tell you about the commercial we did? Yeah, you told me about the commercial, which yeah. is just insane. Oh yeah, he was. But he he was he was an event, and mm. uh, and Barbara, of course, I love Barbara. Barbara Sinatra is one of the great ladies of the world, you know. And uh, the two of them, that love affair, went on for many many years. And she would stay up all night with him, and so would I. That was the problem. I would look a lot different if it hadn't been for Sinatra. I mean, we, I went three weeks with no sleep with him. But how could you go home, right? Something you big could be home. happening. Yeah, we, we we'd been out one night, and we came back to his bar, which was a great house in Beverly Hills. And, we're in there, and he says, well, come on, crazy, let's go get a drink. I said, what? He says, let's go out. I said, Frank, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. He said, well, I, let's go. I want to go somewhere. I said, Frank, I can't. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. And he said, that does it, crazy. I've got to get younger friends. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is uh, another piece uh, from Laugh-In, and it is, of course, the 50th anniversary. The box set is available uh, on June fifteenth, but this is General Bull Wright with Dan Rowan, and Dan went for these jokes even though he was kind of right wing himself, right? He was he was right wing. When yeah. I when when I got forced, the network decided that we couldn't do the way we were doing it anymore, and so I left. But uh, then they became fierce Nixon supporters. But Dan Dan was a brilliant actor, mm -hmm. and he came he he came in with that character of General Bull Wright. Who said what the right wing was saying, but we said it funny. And uh, General Bull Wright became a very, very famous guy. <laughs> famous guy. All right, America, shape up or ship out. It's General Bull Wright here. Drop your socks and grab your notes. You people will take pencils. What? Well, they know what I mean. Over here tonight, my commentary is brought to you by the makers of Mace and Tear Gas. Promising better things for better living through chemistry. Others are satisfied users, including the National Guard and the Chicago Police Department. They both carry the Reagan peacekeeping seal of approval. All right. Now in a... Over here. Now in a serious vein. Tonight I want to talk about all those bleeding heart liberals who say our military spending is too high. Boulder Dash! Why, if anything, it's not high enough. It's military spending that put this country in the shape it's in today. I manage to keep it that way with nothing more to work with and a small, limited war in Southeast Asia. Now these weeping liberals want to take our good... What? Now these weeping liberals want to take our good defense dollars for the poverty program. Well, I ask you, what has poverty ever done for your country? Think about it. Look alive, Congress. Give our nation what it needs most. A guaranteed annual war. Now it is. Secure for the night. Smoke if you got it. I like to leave you with this thought, friends. An America at war with someone else is an America at peace with itself. So remember, make war, not love. Oh, that was many years ago. Many years ago. And it sounds like Trump today. Yes. When Trump says we have to rebuild the military. We already have more aircraft carriers than everybody else combined. <laughs> We also just developed a twice the speed of sound fighter. It doesn't have an enemy. There's no. It, it goes past anything. It's going to shoot at right. But uh, Trump. Trump doesn't sound unlike Dan. No, it's very, very. Nothing is really changed. I mean, you could have listened to this ten years later or twenty years later, and things really don't change that much. All we did was just exaggerate it just yes. a little, and come to find out, it's not exaggerated. It's Donald Trump right now. You know, and when you think about it, every president has had to have a war so that they're commander-in-chief, including, you know, Ronald Reagan's war? Uh, small little island, right? Grenada. Grenada, yeah. Grenada, right? It was, yeah. it was, they had Boy Scouts. They didn't have an <laughs> army, right? <laughs> but he had to go to war with somebody. I liked Ronald Reagan. I had a great time with him. Well, you yeah. also, didn't you produce a show for George W. Bush, too? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Was that his inauguration? Or? Yeah, it was Buzz Cohen. Yeah. He said, you have to, Jerry Weintraub said to me, you have to do me a favor. I said, what? He said, I want you to produce the inauguration. I said, you crazy. I don't even, I'm, I'm way to the left of that. So anyhow, I did. I produced the inauguration. That, and that's when I met uh, Barbara Bush, who I just love. Yeah. And uh, she was on the way. And I said, I will do it. But uh, no officers, only enlisted people will be there. And they said, you can't tell the president. I said, no, but if, he, if there's officers, I won't be there. So they explained this to Barbara Bush. And she said, I agree with him. It should be just enlisted people. And so when she showed up, I thanked her, and I said, thank you so much. I said, there's one more favor. She said, what's that? And I said, well, 
When the president comes in, they'll play Hail to the Chief. The next person to come out will be Frank Sinatra. When he comes out, I'd like to play Hail to the Chief. <laughs> she says, they're right about you. You are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> we wound up friends ever since. Uh, you were friends with Jerry Weintraub as oh, well? Oh, Jerry Weintraub was what? a piece of work. Oh, he yeah, was an he's... original. There was only one. Yeah. And he was committed to the Bushes. So as a result, I wound up doing uh, celebration of uh, the, the inaugurations. And oh. I would say, Jerry, I'd get back there, and it was two degrees above zero, and I was freezing, right? The, the Rockettes couldn't work. And uh, <laughs> Van Cliburn was going to play, and Steinway said, you can play, but if you break that piano, you bought it. So it was, but, and then it was, this was interesting with George Bush. Uh, it was two degrees above zero, and it was freezing cold, and we were out in front of the Lincoln Memorial. And they came downstairs, and he said, that these guys in the black coats with the hats, right? And they said, that we uh, we have news for you. It's been canceled. And I said, what? They said, you, you, you've got this entire show with the Rockettes, and everybody's coming. And, they, and you, you can't cancel it. They said, yes, the president decided to cancel I said, well, you tell him that it's back on. We're going to do this show if I do it with a megaphone and flashlights. <laughs> we're going to we're, we're do it. This guy's in 125-degree heat waiting for the show. We're going to do it. And uh, And they said, what? I said, that's it. They said, you can't tell them. No, I just did. We're going to do the show. So they came back and they said, it's back on. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a life of a producer, right? There's always something coming you up. Got to, yeah, you've got to take chances and you've got to have, be resilient. You know, mm. I bounced back more times than uh, I care to remember. And I certainly hope you don't remember. <laughs> All right, here's uh, another piece uh, from Laughing, And this is just uh, one-liners that you know by heart. Uh, it's Judy Carn, uh, oh. Artie Johnson, Alan Seuss, Dave Madden, Ruth Buzzy, uh, part of this amazing cast of characters that Joanne you brought Worley together. Joanne Worley was in yeah. there, and of course Lily and Goldie and... Uh, Flip Wilson was the regular. It's amazing. On January the 22nd, 1968, America heard things like... Suck it, Jimmy. Very interesting, but stupid. If it feels good, do it. Are you doing it? Doing it. <laughs> <laughs> One ringy dingy. Lock that up in your funkin' wagnall. Well, ring my chimes. You bet you're sweet, Biffy. Here comes the judge. If your lawyer is sleeping, better give him a nudge. Everybody look alive, because here comes the judge. <laughs> now, look, look that up in your funk and wagon. They made them very nervous. We were just, <laughs> we, they said, why do you do the... Funk and wag, right? We never did the F word, but we came real close. Yeah, you, know? you came as close as people could be comfortable with it. Yeah. And you have to remember, 50 years ago, no, doing no. these... Uh... Well, they didn't even know. It went so fast, they didn't realize mm -hmm. that uh, the Farkle family, you know, was... <laughs> <laughs> they said, well, why do you do that? I said, it's a speech impediment, you know. Look that up in your... Funk and wag, <laughs> And again, like you said, this is something even kids were loving because it was moving so fast. And the show had uh, a visual aspect of the, the, you know, almost like a Andy Warhol type look. Well, it was. And the thing was that the television was there much longer. I mean, sketches ran 10 yeah. or 12 minutes. Nobody was used to kind of one line, punch line, and move it on. But the interesting thing is, that when they tested the show, they found out kids retained more out of laughing than they retained out of normal television because it uh, got their attention. Their their and, minds are moving fast and already. Today, television is like well, serious serious mm. radio is uh, you know is replaced television. You can listen to a, an entire series just in your car on the way to work. Yeah, that brevity, that uh, uh, compressing information, which we now have to do. But I, we, we, we even compress the lies now. You're not too sure. Yeah, right. And the kids get the news now from uh, well, late night. <laughs> yes, they do. Yeah. Uh, I always thought that one of the great things that worked for you was having the joke wall. And it looked as if Peter Max had painted it, and suddenly the people were coming out of the wall doing jokes. Exactly. Uh, it was amazing. How did that idea? It was the material that the uh, set designer did mm -hmm. for these script books. And I said, wow, I love that look of all those things. Said, could, could you make that big and could we have the doors open? And uh, what was interesting, the joke wall was funny. It was just the doors would open and we would do jokes and nobody knew for sure who was coming out or when. And uh, what went on behind the joke wall was as funny as anything that went on with it because 
strange and exotic yeah. things were going on behind. And you just knew you were not seeing everything that was going on. And you were right. You weren't seeing everything that was going on. Uh, I, I always thought that, too, of, like, who's underneath Goldie, who's underneath Judy. That's you know right. what I mean? That was hilarious. Uh, well, Judy, Judy, kind of, we haven't talked about her. She was she was a piece of work. Um, but she was uh, a piece of work. She stayed in the newspaper gossip columns for all the kinds of different things. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> but that was... That that was, was Judy. Judy yeah, was, was an Judy. event. Yeah. Judy was an event. Did a lot of artificial stimulants. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but she was an event. I just loved her. And she would do anything. And actually, the way Judy Carn happened was we were riding along in the car one day, and Aretha Franklin's record of respect was there. And she, in the record, did Sock It To Me, Sock It To Me, Sock It To Me. And Jolene says, why don't you do that on a laugh? And I said, I can't say Sock It To Me because it had a mild sexual connotation. And uh, so my our daughter was in the back seat, and she started doing Sock It To Me, Sock It To Me. Jolene says, well, why don't you do that on the show? Like, Jolene had done the Ernie Kovac shows, and so she was largely responsible for any connection with sanity that I had then or now. Yeah. And she said, why don't you do that on the show? And when Judy, when Maria started doing Sock It To Me, Sock It To Me, we said, let's do it. So in order to get it on the air, because they thought it had a mild sexual connotation, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, we had water hitter. And so anytime Judy said Sock It To Me, things happened, trap doors, water, balloons. And uh, Sock It To Me became a... And eventually, our most famous Sock It To Me was Richard Nixon. Well, we have that clip, and I think it's, yeah, it's the perfect way to wrap this up, because uh, nobody could believe that Nixon would go on laughing. Nobody could believe uh, that he did Including didn't me. Yeah. Including me. We went over to CBS. He was doing a press conference, and Paul Keyes was his best friend. And Paul Keyes says, why don't you say Sock It To Me? And it's a way to reach the young people. And uh, so Nixon stood there, and he said, Sock It To Me. Said, no, 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 Mr. Nixon. Would you just smile and say, Sock It To Me? Yes, yes. This comedy thing is new for me. Take two, right? <laughs> and hold up three fingers. <laughs> and uh, so he did Sock It To Me. And we took that and put it on the air the next night, I think. And that just, they said that that helped elect him. You know, I've had to live with that. Yeah, you have had to live with it. But, but who, who ever thought Nixon would look as good as he does today? <laughs> yes. I mean, only, only Donald Trump could make Nixon look good. All right, let's play that uh, clip. This is, believe it or not, Richard Nixon doing laughing. And now, folks, it's sock it to me time. <laughs> sock it to me? <laughs> Even the line he got off, you're still wondering if he knows what's going on there, right? No, he sock didn't it know. to he me? He didn't know. No, no, yeah. he didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, anyway, my my adventures with Richard Nixon went on and on and on. Uh, laughing at fifty years um, uh, again, uh, I'm sure it works as nostalgia for some people, but for any young people, I think this is a brand new experience for them to go out and watch a show that probably could be uh, uh, produced in the same way today. And now you're looking into doing that, George. We're, we're going to do a new laughing, and we're going to do a new real people. Real people probably has much effect on the industry as sure. laughing because it was the first reality show. So that was also one of my favorite shows with Sarah Purcell and that group. And we, we went out and found wackos, but we also did the biggest and most famous pieces celebrating the military. Mm. The Tuskegee Airmen became a movie and the Navajo Coke Talkers became a movie. Yeah. So we would go out and find those spiritual, emotional, uh, you know, feel good shows and people that had never gotten any attention. And so we celebrated them on Real People. So I also think it would be interesting for people to see Skip Stevenson because I always thought that Letterman kind of was the a little bit, yeah, yeah, a little bit of that, the same kind of delivery. It's a very interesting, maybe because they're both Midwestern guys. Yeah, and Skip Skip was a little strange, but yeah. it worked, you know. But Sarah Purcell was the secret of that. Yeah, show. She, she was. She, I mean, people and the military absolutely adored Sarah Purcell, and we did more positive pieces about the military than any show in the history of television. And the news would get very upset with us because we were doing so. We said, that should be on the news. Yeah, but you won't do it because you can't do it in two minutes. Right. We would celebrate them. And then, and uh, they eventually all got citations and and uh, presidential visits and so forth. And it was 
I was as proud of real people as I was of life. Well, uh, I'm looking forward to your next projects. I really am, and I hope you well, get these we're, we're going. Well, we're talking like about different yeah. things. Who would think, you know, I'm, I'm right now working on my 18th comeback. <laughs> That's great, though, right? <laughs> That's all part of the fun. you gotta, you got to have some scars for you to enjoy Oh, oh yeah, this times, is right? all just head-to-toe <laughs> scar tissue. But I have had a good time. Sure. And, and I've celebrated life, and I've celebrated the industry, and I've, I'm really proud of television up until kind of now. It's, we, we've got to do some work on television. It's the 50th anniversary of Laughing. You can pick up the complete box set uh, June 15th. And, of course, look out for real people coming back to yeah. Amazon, right? Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, George Slaughter. You're this the best, been, my This friend. has been a delightful experience. You're very good at this. Thank you, know. you very you much, my friend. You should definitely consider this as a line of work. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look into it after today. I would stay in today. it, because yeah. you, you're a great promise. Thank you, You my even friend. made me sound sane. <laughs>